This happened to a friend of mine who lived in the same neighborhood as me when we were about eight to nine years old. My friend Emily and her family lived just a few houses down the street from mine. We lived in a neighborhood where almost everyone knew each other. The biggest worry we had was that some outsider would come into the neighborhood and cause trouble. Some people even left their homes unlocked because they felt that safe. There was an incredibly nice family that lived directly across the street from Emily's house. A mum, a dad, and a 16 year old son, and their other mentally challenged son who was 22 years old called Tim. Tim was always home because he wasn't employed due to his disability. But his parents were working full time and his brother had school. All day every day he would be outside waving and smiling at anyone who drove or walked by. Big smiles, showing all his teeth and sometimes giggling. Just out of the pure excitement and happiness of interacting with other people since he spent most of his time alone. He was not creepy. One day, Emily was sick and didn't go to school. Even though she was only about eight or nine years old, Emily was allowed to stay home sick by herself. But her mum was going to be home around two anyway, since she only worked part time and the neighborhood was safe, right? Emily locked all the doors except the one that led to the garage. They used this as their front door because it was an easier way to access the home. You just park your car in the garage and go through the side door. This is obviously not the safest way to protect your home from intruders, but we literally all did it. As if a flimsy garage door could keep anyone from getting in if they wanted to. The worst part is that they had an outside cat and kept the garage door cracked just enough for him to get inside for his food and shelter if he needed it. So Emily's asleep, feeling sick with a fever. All the doors and windows are locked except the door leading to the crack garage door. Tim was bound to know she was home alone since he was outside the front of his house the whole time. Emily wakes up to a pounding on the front door. Startled, she walks downstairs and looks through the peephole. It's Tim. She cracks the door and he says something along the lines of how he notices everything and would guard her home since she's home alone. She says thanks, but there was no need and to have a good day. It was beautiful weather. He got angry. You think I can't do it because I'm dumb? But watch and see because I'm not dumb. She apologized and didn't mean it like that, but that she had to rest now. She dozed off and woke up to a noise downstairs in the kitchen, which happened to be the room the door from the garage led to. She hadn't heard the garage door open, but she was sick, so she figured she was in a deep sleep and simply hadn't noticed. Being completely disoriented from time, she looked over at the alarm clock. It was only 10.20, far too early for her mother to be home. At that moment, she heard the noise again. She didn't call out. She had been sleeping in her parents' bedroom and ran into the bathroom, slamming the door loudly. She then remembered that this particular bathroom door did not have a lock on it. The noise she made slamming the door alerted the intruder to where in the house she was and the big footsteps started to ascend. She moved quickly and quietly to her parents closet, which was on the other side of the room. She closed the door and hid behind some clothes, all the time thinking how someone would have gotten inside. She remembered that the garage door was cracked for the cat, slightly, but not close enough for a thin person to slip underneath. Tim walks into the bedroom. Tim is tall and thin, and she can see him through the slatted closed doors. She sees him holding a weapon and did everything she could not to scream. The sheen of it made her panic. He quickly went to the master bathroom where she was just moments before. These cookie cutter houses only had about three floor plan layout, so it wasn't hard for him to find. He looked inside the bathroom and didn't see her, then started making loud throaty noises 
like someone would if they were frustrated or angry. While pacing the entire house, she stayed in the closet for hours, even after she heard him exit through the front door. She stayed there until her mother got home. She was crying hysterically and told her mother what happened. Had she not been so upset, and had one of their kitchen knives not been left by the front door, her mum might have blamed it on being delirious from a high fever, because no one would expect Tim to do that. The police were called and an official report was filed. I'm not sure if he had any charges pressed against him, because after she told me the story once, she refused to talk about it again. I overheard her parents a few times talking about the situation to my own parents, but never heard what the consequences were. Emily was so traumatized she went to therapy afterwards for several years, and still wouldn't talk to anyone about it because she didn't want to remember nor relive the experience. We even moved into an apartment together years and years later for college purposes. She never talked about Tim. It was like he never existed, and I never asked. I noticed she always locked the front door, which you should of course. And the one that led to the patio and balcony, even though we were on the seventh floor, and always locked her bedroom door, to which she added an additional lock. And when she locked all of these doors and windows, she would always check three times, every single one. I often wonder if there was more to the story that Emily wanted to tell me. We were kids after all, and sometimes kids don't know how to explain the things they don't understand. It's terrifying to think about what his intentions were, and if he perhaps did find Emily, and something else happened. As horrifying as the experience must have been for her, it made a huge statement in the neighborhood for everyone to be more careful. I will always make sure everything is locked. This dream has stayed with me and I think it always will. Although not profound or life-altering, I've never been able to shake the memory and the feeling of absolute terror and dread. To give some context, this was a number of years ago. Currently, I'm 23 years old, and this dream occurred at the age of 11. As a child, I suffered from sleep paralysis for a number of years. At first, this terrified me to the point of me not wanting to sleep, it became so bad that I pushed myself to states of exhaustion before my body could no longer remain conscious and I would pass out, only to return to the horrifying imagery of my subconscious. The first time I ever experienced sleep paralysis, I still lived with my aunt who fostered me, which is another story entirely. But I was in my old room in my old bunk bed and I remember it all so clearly. I awake to the sensation of not being able to move, struggle as I may, and this confused me, but didn't scare me, not yet. It was only when I saw what stood in the corner of the room did my fear really start to descend. It was a hooded figure, all black, so very black, darker, and the darkest shade of black. In its hand was some kind of weapon, like an oddly shaped axe or scythe. Its face was that of a skeleton, ghostly white, and dark black holes that felt as though they were sucking the life straight out of you, where his eyes should have been. It stood there, staring at me. My eyes widened as I prayed for this to be some kind of dream or hallucination. I was frozen in fear, not that I could escape, even if I had the courage to move. Its sharp, crooked, daggered teeth began to form a smile, the most gut-wrenching, heart-stopping smile I could ever imagine. The kind of smile that eludes to such confidence, such domination and power over me, that it only frightened me more and intensified my fear. It slowly, creakily, almost clockwork doll-like, began to turn its head, 
continuing until it was such at an unnatural angle, and then it started to inch towards me. It didn't walk. It simply began to move closer. It didn't obey any natural law or any flicker of logic. I guess in retrospect it makes perfect sense, just adding to my confusion. It edged even closer to me, unmoving and unchanging in its deadlock, icy grin, its gaze of absolute horror still peering into my soul. Looking back, I can still picture it, and it disgusts me. It continued until it was halfway across the room. Then, without warning, it just stopped. This is where my blood ran cold. It slowly raised its arms from beneath its cloak to reveal its hideous, revolting arm, a mixture of rotting flesh on bone, decomposing right there in front of me, and the sight of it made me want to gag. Then it did something I'll never forget. It methodically raised its hand slowly, that putrid thing, and began to point. Not at something in the room, but at me. My eyes widened further still, and my heart began to thump in my chest. It then placed both hands upon his head, and began to twist and pull his head back into place. The noise sent shivers down my spine. It creaked and cracked, and screamed back into place, and then the figure began to approach me. It was at this point the full-blown panic set in, and I started to struggle. I kicked and twisted and tried to throw my body, but I could not. I couldn't move. I was trapped and paralyzed as the ominous creature drew ever closer. I couldn't free my invisible shackles. So I screamed with all my might. I thought at the very least my family would be alerted. At the very least, they'd surely see what happened to me. Fair whatever small comfort that may bring. But to my dismay, no sound came from my mouth. I tried again, but now the figure was almost at the foot of my bed. My cries for help failed. In my head, I was screaming like a madman. The figure was now at the foot of my bed. Only now it's not smiling, but it looks more terrifying, teeth all aligned jaggedly. I continued to struggle, but it was futile. It continued to get closer and closer until it was stood right in front of me at the side of my bed. I was frozen. I just looked back at it, petrified. It leaned in until its face was face to face with me, and at this point I knew my life was over. It reached its arm towards me, and it screamed a blood-curdling scream. I closed my eyes and prepared myself to be ripped apart by this thing. But no. Nothing. Just like that, it was gone. I look around my room with my heart thumping so hard I thought it would burst from my ribcage. I was sweating profusely, and I was afraid. I scanned the room, but it was empty. I turned on the light. Nothing. I crawled back into bed, confused and fearful. No more sleep was had the next night, and the light remained on. The previous night's ordeal haunted me, the next day, and I couldn't focus. I tried to talk with my aunt, but she put it down to a bad dream, maybe a demon that had taken a liking. The latter was her way of trying to be funny and reassure me that it wasn't real, but I didn't find it comforting in the slightest. In fact, it made me more paranoid, and I dreaded going back to bed that night. When night came, I wasn't prepared and I decided I wouldn't sleep in fear of what I saw returning. I tried my hardest, but eventually my struggles resulted in failure. It was no good. My eyes became heavy and tears started to stream down my face. Whatever that thing was had shaken me to my very core. It might sound silly to some, but I genuinely believed that when I fell back asleep, my life would be in serious danger. I sobbed and cried myself to sleep, and the next morning I awoke, and I was fine. No figure, no traumatic experience, at all. And this filled me with so much joy, than ever before. Maybe it had just been a dream. Maybe I didn't have to face this thing. 
It was exhilarating. Later on, I would learn about sleep paralysis, as I did end up suffering from it for quite a few years, and ended up doing some research, which confirmed it to be nothing more than sleep-related hallucinations. Even when they would return several times as I returned to sleep, eventually I did discover something useful, something to help you escape, even if it's just temporarily. The trick is to move. I know you probably think, well, that's useful considering you're legitimately paralyzed, hence the name sleep paralysis, but there's something many people fail to consider. Yes, it's true you can't move your arms or legs or even your head. You can't scream or make a sound, but what you can do is move your tongue. It sounds silly, but move your tongue as much as possible and as quickly as possible. And if you try and waggle those fingertips and toes at the same time, you'll wake up much faster. Maybe there's someone hearing this who's suffering from sleep paralysis. Maybe there's people listening who already know this and don't believe it would work. But if you're suffering and the once tranquil thought of sleep has been replaced with the fear of what awaits you, then give it a try. It may just help. At the time of this story, my family and I lived in Northeast Ohio. Most of our extended family on my father's side lived in central Florida. So for the Christmas holidays, we would go and spend time with my grandparents and aunts and uncles. At the time I was six years old, my brother Ross was four, and my brother Chase was two, and my brother Braden was four months. The trip down to Florida was uneventful. We did not come across any car wrecks or anything of interest. It was a very long drive though especially with a four-month-old baby. We drove in a red minivan that was loaded down to clothes and toys. You can imagine all the toys that we bought to celebrate our Christmas, along with what our grandparents were going to give us. Christmas with my grandparents was fantastic. We had aunts and uncles and lots of cousins. We ate, talked and played. There were tons of toys and new outfits. When the time came to go home, we had twice as much as what we came with. My mum had to put our clothes in trash bags and pack them underneath the seats and on the floorboards of the van. When we climbed in, we were walking on top of our toys and clothes and we didn't mind it much being kids. We started our long trip back. After we went north for a while and were in a different state, my dad realized that we were losing gas incredibly fast. We had to stop several times to fill up. And that's when my dad decided to stop at a mechanics. We had spent all of our extra money in Florida and my parents had not planned on having to stop to get the van serviced. It was kind of neat and kind of annoying at the same time to be stuck in this mechanic shop, not having the money for a hotel or even a motel. So we spent the night in the car while it was up in the lift at the mechanics worked underneath it. Loud, noisy, and not smelling very good. After lots of money and being stuck in a mechanic shop for a while, my dad decided that enough was enough and we were going to leave. A lot of improvements had been made to the van, but the main problem was not fixed. Back on the road, we finally made it to the Smoky Mountains. It was beautiful considering that it was Christmas time and there was pristine snow on both sides of the highway. It was very early morning and we had just woken up. We were in pajamas and odds and ends of clothing. My brother Chase was wearing his coat and a pair of sweatpants. Ross only wore a pair of sweatpants and I had a pair of corduroy pants, socks and a t-shirt. My mum had opened the bag of M&Ms that had been sitting between her and my dad while they were driving down the road, periodically handing us back handfuls of bright candy. I had climbed up to the middle seat where my brother's car seat was slid in while he went to the back to sit with Russ. Since I was in the middle, I had to give candy to my two younger brothers. It was odd because the candy coating was melting, leaving yellow and green smears all over my hands. It was the 80s and we weren't wearing seatbelts. My mom had just finished feeding Braden 
and set him back in the car seat, not bothering to buckle him up either. It's important to note that my brother Chase did not talk a lot. In fact, he only spoke when he really wanted to, which was quite rare. And this made all of the situation so much more shocking. We were rolling along in relative silence when my brother Chase yelled out, fire. Everyone in the car quickly turned to see the orange and yellow flames in the back window. My mother quickly turned to my dad and quietly said, Kevin, we're on fire. My dad started tapping the brakes to slow down, turned on his turn signal and tried to get us out of the right lane to the left lane so that we could stop. He looked at my mum, and I remember him saying in a hushed voice, no brakes. At this point, other cars had began to slow down with us and had started to honk on their horns to get our attention to let us know we were on fire. My dad continued into the left lane and nudged the guardrail, which startled us all. He was using it to help us slow down since our brakes had long since burnt off and were probably laying in the middle of the highway somewhere. We had slowed down some, but were not slowing down enough. In my mum's mind, she saw us all perishing. She made a decision that to this day still shocks me. She opened her car door and leapt out. All of a sudden, my mum was gone. I couldn't see her, and then the sliding door opened with a fierce crack. It promptly fell off and hit the road. My mum, being the superwoman that she was, leapt over the top of the door and continued to run alongside the van. The woman was running next to a moving, flaming vehicle. As we slowed down, the flames had become much higher. Now they were starting to encircle the van. They had slowly crept up from the back window around to the sides where the sliding door was and were almost at the front doors. My mum was faced with a wall of fire between her and her children. She later told us that she couldn't see much through the flames. What she did see were the bright colors of Chase's coat. She reached through the flames and grabbed my little brother and pulled him out. She then threw him on the side of the road. He bumped and skidded along the soft shoulder of gravel. And a few moments later, my dad was able to get the car stopped by bumping the guardrail. And now that my mum's door was shut because of the guardrail and the wall of fire that I saw out the sliding door, I had no way out. My dad threw open his door and I saw my chance. I grabbed his broad shoulders and hung on for dear life. As he jumped out the van, he inadvertently dragged me along with him pulling me over his seat. Boy, was I lucky. When he ran around to the side of the van, I slid off of him. I looked for my mum and saw her running down the mountain. I climbed over the guardrail and began to run to her and yell for her. And she turned and yelled at me to run. I started down the steep hill of the mountain. It was freezing. The snow had dug one of my socks off my foot. I stopped to look for my sock. And that is when I saw my mum saw me and yell again for me to keep running. She stopped and waited for me. When I got to her, she grabbed me and continued to run as fast as she could. I was cold, but she said it didn't matter. Little did I know that my dad had gone in to rescue my two other brothers. When he reached the side of the van where the sliding door had been, he was met with the same thing my mum was, a wall of fire. He knew that Braden's car seat was just beyond the flames he reached out and grabbed my infant brother as the fire engulfed his car seat. My brother Russ had made it from the back seat to the middle and then to the front seats. And my dad told him to jump as the flames overtook the van. Turning to make his escape and jump over the guardrail, my dad reached behind for my brother. To his surprise and horror, my brother wasn't there. He turned and saw my brother still standing between the two front seats. So he did what any dad would. He reached through the fire once again and grabbed my brother by the back of his sweatpants. He yanked him out, threw him over the shoulder, quickly turning and putting one leg over the guardrail to make a dash for safety. The van exploded. The force knocked my dad over the rail and put him and my two brothers in the snow. He was able to keep hold of his sons and run. The van proceeded to explode twice more. As my mum and me went further down the mountain, she was able to see what was happening. When we eventually heard the boom, she shielded mine and my brother's tiny frames with her body. Eventually, we all met up on the side of the road. There was a nice older lady waiting for us with a blanket. 
She took me, Russ and Chase and put us in her car with the heat on full blast. When the door shut, Russ turned to us and said, look. He opened his hands and had showed us a melted mess of green, yellow and orange candy. They'd melted. Fire trucks and ambulances showed up. My mum was trying to hush Braden, but the heat had been so intense that it had dried up her milk and she couldn't feed him. The firemen gave us colouring books and oxygen. At the hospital, we were all examined. I only had a small scratch from the snow. Russ was treated for smoke inhalation. His blonde hair was now so matted and an orange colour from the heat and flames. My dad had no hair on either arm and no eyebrows and was treated for smoke inhalation also. My mum's arm was hairless. Her milk was dry, but she was fine. Chase had some road rash from my mum getting him out of the way. Poor Braden, he had it the worst. While my dad had been trying to get him out, there must have been a flame or some hot metal that he touched. He had been burnt so badly. 30 years on, fortunately, he has no scars or any lasting damage. We really should have all perished. There are a lot of ifs or buts, but the important thing is we're alive. My parents are heroes. They saved not one, but four kids under the age of seven. They literally went through fire for us, risked life and limb, and that is pure love. That is family. The cause of the fire was a dime sized hole in the gas tank. The mechanics had fixed everything but that. 30 years later, I'm still afraid to get into any red minivans. This was started in January of 2019. For some background context, I'm a young gay man living in a very populated city. So weird things are bound to happen, especially when using the gay dating app Grindr. I'm sure you've all heard of it. When this started, I was living in a biggish city in Northern Florida, but had plans to move the next week. My two friends had come down to celebrate my moving away and also one of their birthdays. We hung out in my city for a day and then drove to Miami together. It was a lot of fun for the most part, but this story begins on the last day of my vacationing there. We were at a brunch place preparing to say goodbye to the city and drive back home so that I could pack my things and relocate to where I live now. And I received a notification from Grinder, saying that I had received a new message. I opened it up and the message simply said hi. It was from a blank profile and it said it was sent using a feature called explore, meaning the person wasn't local to Miami but lived elsewhere. I replied, not minding the faceless profile, because a lot of men on the app are not open with their sexuality and might not want to take the risk of people in their actual life finding out about them. We make small talk, exchange names and such, and he seemed like a really nice person. He eventually sent me a picture of him and he was very attractive looking. He asked me for my number and I was so flustered by Miami and saying goodbye to our temporary friends that I just gave it to him without thinking about what could come of it. And I regret this dearly. We messaged each other over the next few days and things seemed pretty normal. We talked a lot, just casual chit chat, asking about careers, goals, etc. Nothing strange. And then I noticed a notification from the cash app that I had received $100 from a random username I didn't recognize. The memo was an eggplant emoji, gross. And I was so confused I started texting my friends, telling them how a random person had just accidentally sent me a hundred bucks and how he'd have to keep sending me more in order to ask me to return it because you can only communicate with someone on the app if it's included in a payment. We got a laugh out of this and I decided to just return the money because I would be really upset if I was on the other end of the equation and had just sent a gracious amount of money to someone random by accident. Before I was able to do that though, my new grinder friend texted me and said, don't ask me for any more. That's all I can give you. I will block you if you ask me to send you more. I was so confused. 
I never asked this man for money. I have no idea how he even got my Cash App username. I know you can look people up using their phone numbers, but I hadn't even linked my new phone number to the app yet. I replied, asking him how he got my information, but he wouldn't say anything about it. I guess I just dropped it because free money, and I'm an idiot for that. Time goes on and things are getting a little weird between our messages. He begins asking me to send him pictures of my feet, which in of itself isn't weird. I don't like to kink shame, but something just felt very off about him at this point. It's as if I were talking to a new person. I tell him that he needs to calm down a bit and that this was getting uncomfortable for me, to which he agrees. Time goes by and eventually he insinuates that I should move back to Florida, to the city where he was located, so that he could take care of me. I firmly decline, to which he says, well then I'll have to come to you. At this point my alarm bells are going off and I'm thinking, I've got to put an end to this. I don't reply right away anymore, and he tells me he's always wanted to come to where I currently live. I didn't even know how he knew that. I didn't give him any of my social media and even if I had, there's no way he could have known because I intentionally withheld any information online about me relocating as I was tired of everyone knowing my business. I've always had my location on Grinder set to off so he couldn't see where I was or even how many miles away from him. I told him at that point, he needs to leave me alone and that I didn't wish to talk to him. I didn't block him though, because I was starting to get paranoid and wanted to have a record of the things he would continue to say in case things got weird, which of course they did. First, he told me he was sorry for lying and sent me a few pictures of what he actually looked like. I hate to sound like a jerk, but something was seriously off with the way this person looked. Almost every picture had a very big, disturbing and ecstatic smile and big wide eyes staring directly at the camera, very close up. He was probably in his 30s and looked like he didn't take care of himself very well. His skin was uneven and gray, and he had a short beard that looked like it hadn't been maintained at all, if that makes any sense. One of them looks like it might have just been an accident because his face was blurry and he was angry and just staring into the camera with a hateful evil expression on his face. He also sent me a picture of his mouth, but only his big smile. Nothing else was in it. There were pictures of his apartment as well. It looked almost empty, other than a small table with a photograph of unknown people in it. Also a fire hydrant was there. It was all very weird. I didn't reply to these, and that just resulted in a string of angry texts from him, telling me he wished he'd never met me and that he hates me. Throughout all of the weird, uncomfortable, and filthy messages he sent me, there are a few exceptionally disturbing things. He sent me a link to his YouTube page, which I did end up viewing, and the videos were just him literally talking to himself and making jokes to himself. There were over 10 videos of them, and I was the first viewer, although they'd been up for months. If that wasn't weird enough, whenever he would pause in between sentences in these videos, I could hear faintly in the background what sounded like someone's muffled screaming. And every so often, after hearing the screaming, I would hear him try to hold back a very high pitched sinister laugh that sounded nothing like him. I could tell from the sound quality that it was something this man was producing and not a bystander. I also don't think he has many friends. Most of the videos have since been deleted and I don't know why. I write poetry and at some point he was begging me to send him my poetry. He also sent me a link to his WordPress, which I also viewed and the poems were somehow actually very well written, like extremely beautiful poems. But I realized that the things he was saying in them made absolutely no sense. I tried analyzing them anyway. I could because I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this guy, and none of them made sense. He would randomly send me small amounts of money on the app, I guess in an attempt to get me to talk to him. 
Fast forward a little bit. The timeline, bear in mind, is slightly messy because this was just constant stress on me. And I was still receiving messages from him every 10 minutes that I wasn't replying to. These were weird. Here are what some of them said. Did you block me? You want to put me out your life? That's fine. But it's an irreversible decision. When you push me out of your life, you don't get me back. When you feel dumb about it later, and you will. I am the best thing that's happened to you in years. It's a privilege you know me. You want to clear a space out for someone more deserving because you're an upty little so-and-so? No problem. You're not getting rid of me. Stuff like that. I withheld some of the more vile and descriptive ones because it said what he would do to me and because I didn't like to read or think about them. He would also reply to his own texts almost instantly and apologize for what he said and told me, please don't go and things like that. I finally broke down and told one of my best friends about this who is also gay, but very muscular and protective of me. I don't know. He just makes me feel safe somehow and I didn't know who else to tell. He immediately got really mad and took my phone and called him. Best friend told him aggressively that he was my boyfriend, which makes no sense because I wouldn't be on Grinder if I had a boyfriend, and that creepy Grinder guy needs to stop reaching out. The Grinder guy is silent, and then suddenly starts hysterically laughing and making the most inhumane, awful noise I've ever heard speaking sentences that were English, but with words that didn't make any sense when put together. This creeped us out. The look on my friend's face still gives me chills. He never gets uncomfortable, but he was just staring at me with this blank expression, and it was in this moment I realized that I should have just blocked this man as soon as I realized something was off. I didn't know what to do, I guess. After the call, he messaged me a bunch of horrible things, and then says sorry, and this is a cycle of about 15 minutes until he sends me this. The private Facebook messages you may see were all written before our conversation via text and phone tonight, so naturally disregard them. I blocked him. I have no idea what he was on about with the Facebook thing. I looked and couldn't find anything. This final exchange happened about a month and a half ago. I thought this was the end until about two weeks ago. I was exploring a nearby large city, and there are loads of big cities around me, and I'm basically in the middle of them, with that same best friend. We're walking out of a museum, and I see someone that looked very familiar leaning against a cement wall to the left of the big stairs that was the entry to the museum. He was staring at us, but I couldn't make anything out about it. I ignored it, and we hopped on the bus to take us to a nearby restaurant for lunch. It wasn't until we got to the restaurant that I realized who this man was. It was him, the creepy grinder guy. I'm sure of it. I have no idea how he knew where I was, but I knew he traveled over a thousand miles to come to the area I was living in. I didn't mention it to my friend because I'm seriously creeped out, but I think I'm gonna tell him when we hang out again because I don't want anything to happen to him either. Luckily, I'm moving again in a few weeks, this time very, very far away, and I'm considering taking all of this to the police, but I don't really have many options. This has seriously been the most uncomfortable experience of my entire life. This happened when I was a toddler, and don't remember it myself, but my family has told me through the years and something that happened to me a few nights ago made me think about it, and my mum filled me in on the details. My mum is a sensitive and can walk into a house and feel spirits, and sometimes tells you if they're evil or just lost. In my family, we have a good amount of non-believers, but also plenty of family members who do believe. So growing up, I've always just felt comfortable with all that. I've lived in haunted houses, spirits have visited me, and the specific story happened when I was four or five. My parents were going through some marriage troubles. My father was getting abusive and lashing out, and obviously my mum was struggling with that. After three months of attitude and personality changes, things started happening to me. I would get bruises on my body, scratches on my back, 
some of them so bad they started bleeding, and I was changing. I'd have trouble sleeping, hated being alone, and I hated my room, and I kept telling people that the man was hurting me. Obviously, this led people to believe it was my father doing it. He had been hitting my mother, yelled at me and locked me in a closet. So, my mum kicked him out, leaving him to go stay with his own father while she tried to figure out what to do. This helped, or so it seemed. I started getting back to normal. I was happy and bubbly, but the bruises and scratches faded. And we were happy for about a month. During a normal bath time, my mother and I were playing with one of my dolls when she noticed something. There was a long scratch down my back. At first, she wrote it off as kids playing around and scratching themselves. That had to be it, but they kept appearing. The bruises were coming back, and then I started talking about the man again. My mum said the way I described him was chilling, and she instantly believed me and contacted her uncle who was a priest for prisons. The story I told my mum was that at night, after she put me to bed, someone would come out of my closet. Not just walk way out, a mist would come from under the closet door and a man would appear from that mist. This man wore what looked to be jeans and a white tank top, which my mum figures was a wife beater of some sort, and would sit on my bed and talk to me. At first, he was nice and play with my hair. He would tell me stories. His name was Bill. He used to be a cop, and he had lost his wife and family because he was bad to them. And then he started to change. He wanted me to go to the closet with him, and that scared me for whatever reason. Even that young, I knew something was wrong. Looking back at the time, my mum believes that it was when I started to be scared of my room and when I wanted to refuse to sleep in there. After I refused the man, he got worse and mean and started hurting me, which is when the bruises and scratches began to appear. He would try pulling me from the bed to the closet. He would throw things at me. But what got my mum is when I started describing what the man said he would do to me and my family if I didn't come with him. Understandably, my mum was very upset, and she called her uncle Tucker, knowing what it had to be. Though she wasn't sure why she'd never felt him, and she felt she had failed me in some way, when Tucker arrived, he talked to me, wanting to know the story, which I shared with him. It piqued his interest because it was a chance that it was simply my imagination. They both felt that my story might have been swayed some, at least a few details. Once he was talking to me, he headed to my room, Bible and holy water in hand. They have both told me that when he walked into the room, instantly something dark washed over him and it worried him. So he started praying, talking to it, and finally blessed the room and Tucker said he could guarantee that it was a demon, and it wanted my soul and possibly to take over my body. From what he could put together, from what was shown and told in the room along with my story, he believes that Bill was a cop, or at least would use that to make his victims more comfortable around him, which wasn't uncommon, and he was sure Bill had harmed his family, and that's why they left him. Tucker thought that the ghost slash spirit slash demon, whatever you want to call it, was hooked onto me, not only because I was a child, which makes the connection easy, but because I was most likely sensitive like my mother, which Tucker had strongly believed since they found out she was pregnant. I won't go into details behind that because there's a lot of information. Back to the point. He warned her that it was probably going to keep happening and that I would deal with it my entire life that I just needed to be strong and not to trust in every spirit I see. Luckily, after he blessed the house and prayed over me, Bill left, and I never dealt with him again. Thankfully, I was young enough that I don't have a memory of it. I've seen pictures of the scratches and bruises, but don't remember it. And while Bill might have left me, I've dealt with spirits my entire life, and I know I always will. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness. 
and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was gonna take, packed my camping gear and a firearm for protection and jumped into my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot and head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer with some lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and too dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. Thinking nothing of it after that, and about to go eat my food, after I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. And I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by, then I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing towards my tent. It's really loud at this point, And it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to what I assume is about the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. There's nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. And I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and try not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my fire up. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and sticks snapping far off to the left. I'm up now, wondering what I'm hearing, if it's real, and if it's just a product of me being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other directions, all different, old men, old women and even children and that confirms it's real. The noises are closing in. I grab my rifle preparing to fire a warning shot in the air in case they come too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night told me that this was not just another family strolling through the woods. I was on edge enough already. But then I noticed that the wildlife was now dead quiet. Not even the wind was making a noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, saw nothing and listened intensely to my surroundings. No laughing and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I'd scared whatever the hell that was off, I sat down in my exhausted state and fell asleep. I wake up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not too far from my tent. Alert, I grab my firearm and listen to what they're saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent again. So I shout out, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower erupted from the middle of the clearing, which illuminated several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my weapon, blowing a hole in the front of my tent and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up, 
sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was, and I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulders the entire way. I never heard anyone follow me, never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me, like I left all my gear in the woods that same night. My husband and I bought a townhouse back in September of 2017, and we've had super weird things happen since. Most of these experiences have happened on our second story. For background, where the stairs come up to my office is immediately to the left. Then there is a long hall to the right with the hallway bathroom. The laundry room just past that is my son's room on the other side, and the master bedroom at the very end of the hall. The access to the attic is in the master bedroom closet. As our family goes, it's me, my husband, our son, and our two large dogs. When we first moved in, our son was barely three years old and had just started making full sentences. He would be playing all day without any issues, but whenever it started to get dark outside, he began getting nervous and wouldn't want to be in his room. He'd come downstairs at one point saying, Mummy, do you hear it? Hear what, kiddo? The baby's crying, Mummy. My son is an only child, so you can imagine my confusion at this time. I came upstairs with him and asked him why he was hearing it from, thinking he may be hearing the neighbours through the wall. He took my hand and pulled me towards the master bedroom, stopping just a short over the threshold. He pointed to the darkest corner of the room and said, Over there. The baby's crying over there. My body went numb. I tried to brush it off and told him there's no baby there and he's just imagining it. This persisted for about a month before he finally stopped talking about the crying baby. During this time, I had been doing research on our house and there had been no deaths in that house that I could find let alone any kids that lived in the house before us. A few weeks after my son stopped mentioning the baby, I started hearing scratching noises above my head in the attic. I told my husband and he thought we had raccoons or some other animal living in the attic. He went up a few days later, but found nothing. I'm normally a heavy sleeper, but at least twice a week I would wake up to hear a faint scratching noise directly above me. I did my best to try and ignore it and go back to sleep. This seemed to work as we hadn't had an issue for a while up until recently. I have always felt somewhat uneasy on the second floor, but I just attributed it to my past paranormal experiences growing up and being a little paranoid. Now I'm thinking my senses were on point. A few months ago, my husband and I were talking about how our son had this weird affinity for the crying baby when he was younger. And I had mentioned that one day when I was taking a nap, I woke up abruptly being sideways on the bed with one leg hanging off towards the closet, almost like I was being dragged towards it. However, I don't remember being pulled at all. All I do is flop around a lot in my sleep. So I brushed it off. After I told my husband about this, he frowned a little bit and said he had a weird experience too recently. Apparently he woke up one morning around 2.30 AM and saw a figure standing by his side of the bed. He said it was all black and he couldn't really make out a face or any distinct features. He went to kick the figure thinking maybe someone had broken into the house and his foot went right through it. This freaked him out a little bit, but he's a firm believer that if you don't acknowledge paranormal things, they can't do anything. So of course he rolls over and goes to sleep and doesn't even think to mention it to me until I told him about my own experience. The whole time we've been here, the dogs will randomly get spooked or will stare at something that I don't see. Every once in a while, our wolf hybrid, who's typically scared of his own shadow will get very upset and his hair will stand on end 
and he will emit a low but vicious growl. Our other dog is a Malanoi slash Black Lab mix, but she's getting old and is 10 years old now and doesn't really do much other than sleep on her bed and try to get all the pets and treats from us. And this brings us to the present. Yesterday, there was a decent storm that came through our area. It was semi dark out and thunder every once in a while. I'm working from home during the virus pandemic and my mum had come to pick up my son around 1130 so that I could work in peace without my son continually bothering me. A few hours later, I'm listening to a podcast while working and I hear a faint mumble that almost sounded like mommy. The chilling thing is that it sounded exactly like my son. I turned around to tell him that he needed to go back to his room and not bother me while I was working. But as I was turning, I remembered he wasn't even home. I was here alone with the dogs. There was no one behind me and no one down the hall. At this point, I try to brush it off, thinking my mind is playing a trick on me. When my wolf hybrid starts losing it, all his hair stands on end. He gets between me and the door and starts doing this low growl. This freaked me out a little bit. But I told him to stop, which he listened to and laid back down, but without taking his eyes off the hallway. About an hour later, I was in the zone with work and was talking to a co worker on our team chat. They sent me something funny enough to make me audibly laugh. I then heard a tiny giggle that sounds exactly like my son coming from his room down the hall, who still isn't home at this point. I nearly fall out of my chair with how scared I was. I got up and checked all the rooms upstairs, but I was home alone like I had thought. I had to get back to work as we were starting to get busy, but I was on edge and straining to hear if anything else was happening behind me. 10 minutes later, I hear the crash of something relatively small, but still loud downstairs. My dogs run down the steps while I follow behind them. My PlayStation controller, which was originally on the charging stand behind the TV, was in the middle of the living room floor. This made my blood run cold, as we had not had anything physically moved yet. And I was having a full blown panic attack. I called my husband who was already on his way home and said he would be there soon. When he got home, everything seemed to have stopped. This all happened from 2 to 4.30 in the middle of a little thunderstorm. I've looked into it, and from what I can gather when something can mimic voices, it's typically evil or demonic. Should I be worried? What do I do in this situation? I don't want to scare my son, and we can't move. But I'm extremely paranoid and scared to be home alone right now. In college, I wait for my roommate to get off work at the new parking garage my campus built. He was a security guard on the night shift. Nothing too crazy most of the time, but one day he finished his shift and I told him I'd meet him outside. He leaves the garage and says, I don't think you're gonna believe me when I tell you this, but I have something to tell someone while it's fresh on my mind. The next part is how I remember him telling me while we sat in the car. He goes, I was sitting in the office chatting it up with a custodian when he pointed to the security camera screen and told me there's a guy in the stairwell. We both looked at the camera closely and sure enough, there's a guy just standing on the landing in the stairwell in an old timey suit and bowler hat and everything. The security guard told me he'd start cleaning at the bottom of the stairs and if he saw the gentleman, he'd tell him to leave. I told him I'd come up to the landing and do the same. I didn't see him on my way to the landing. So I made my way to the stairs while calling out that the garage was closed for the night in case he was hiding. While walking through the stairwell, I startled the custodian because he was expecting to see Mr. Suit as well, but no one left the stairwell at the bottom. I told him I had to check out the rest of the grounds and that maybe he slipped out another way, even though there was no real way either of us could have missed him. I'm approaching the ramp 
of the next last landing on the top of the garage, and I see an older woman in an old timey dress and umbrella. She's going up the ramp in the distance, and I yell at her that she shouldn't be up here and swiftly pick up the pace before I lose sight of her going to the top level. As soon as I arrived to the ramp she was ascending, I don't see her. I got to the top of the ramp and see a kid skateboarding on the last level of the garage. I tell him the garage is closed and he shouldn't be up here, but at the same time wondering where the woman went. The skateboarder apologized and said he'd walk down with me if that would be okay. We got to the bottom and I say, hey man, you see anything weird at this garage tonight? The skateboarder looked at me with the most confusing stare and said, well, there was this older woman standing at the edge of the garage and I didn't see her come up the ramp. I screamed at her to tell her she should be careful and not get too close to the edge. I went to pick up my board and when I looked, she was gone. I ran to the edge to see if she jumped, but nothing. She was gone. She was wearing this old looking dress and an umbrella. I didn't want to tell the kid I saw the exact same woman because I was too freaked out. I suggested that it was probably a costume party and some people were messing around. I couldn't explain the disappearances though. He said he thought the same thing, but he remembers his boss telling him that years ago, 20s era people would dress up in their Sunday duds and walk through the park in town. The park was right where this parking garage was. I'm 23 now. This started when I was three or four. Everything that happened that night, I remember like it was yesterday. The memory so vivid and forever in my mind. The second floor of my house at the time was really just a small landing with three bedrooms and a bathroom off it. Immediately at the top and to your right was my bedroom the bathroom adjacent to the stairs, then my sister's bedroom and my parents' bedroom. My mom would put my sister and I to bed at seven o'clock every night. I always had issues falling asleep as a kid, but would eventually drift off. My bedroom had a closet next to the door and next to that, two windows with a dresser sitting between them, with my bed pushed against the wall, foot end of the bed near the door. One night, not unlike any other, we're put to bed and I finally find sleep after a few hours of just lying there, only to wake up some hours later. It was about two or three in the morning. I rolled over to scan my room. I've always been afraid of the dark. So the room was lit up and my nightlight was plugged in at the end of the bed, standing in front of the window furthest from me, near the closet. I saw what I thought at the time was an angel, quite literally glittering gold in front of my eyes, standing at least seven feet tall, staring out the window. My movement must have grabbed its attention because immediately its head turned to look at me. There were no facial features except for a strong defined jawline, though faceless. It wasn't like a freaky facelessness, at this point, I was more curious than afraid. Then it started to yell at me. It kept telling me to shut up. The yelling quickly turned to screaming and I freaked. I was one giant goosebump and I got up from bed, opened my door and looked into the lit hallway. My parents always left that light on at night in case my sister or I needed something or got scared in the middle of the night. Almost in slow motion, I noticed the air felt too still. Something was off. Before I could process anything, I took one step forward and out of the bathroom shoots this thing. It gets right in front of my face, screaming a blood curdling scream that still echoes in my ear to the day. The face of this thing was just gray and sinister. Eyes completely blacked out skin cracked, no lips, just a black hollow hole with the screams coming from it. Long black hair flying around as if there were a fan switched on behind it and I lost it. I screamed so loud, 
I swear the entire house shook. I barged into my parents' room, tears streaming uncontrollably down my face. My mum looked scared and confused. My dad, just terrified. I don't remember what happened after that. I'm sure I told my parents what happened and ended up sleeping with them for the next few weeks. Growing up, I asked my mum about that night, and she explained how I barged in crying, rambling off some story about an angel or something. Today, I don't know what it was. My dad, on the other hand, never said much about it, and instead started warning me to stay away from Ouija boards and told me some freaky stories about things that had happened to him. As my parents divorced, growing up, things got worse with respect to what I was being exposed to. My dad would show me scary pop-up videos and play creepy music. I was six or seven at this point. Safe to say I hated going to my dad's because I thought whatever I'd seen that night was somehow connected to him. Eventually, my mom remarried. We moved and things were okay. Then I decided to stop seeing my dad completely, for unrelated reasons, as I was nine years old at this time. And that's when things started again. The air was ridiculously heavy all the time. I hated sleeping in my room. I always felt like there was something at the end of my bed, just watching me. I tried to ignore it. For nine years, constantly living in fear, we moved out of that house to somewhere around the corner. And once my mum and stepdad divorced, that way we wouldn't have to switch schools as I was about to graduate high school and my sister still had one more year. I still had access to the house as my ex-stepdad still lived there. They were using my old bedroom for storage and always kept the blinds closed as I had while living there. One morning when everyone in my old house was at work, my friend and I decided to sesh in the garage quickly. We had the okay from the ex-stepdad, so long as we weren't driving anywhere afterwards. We walked through the front door, through the foyer to the garage, and got settled. I could already feel the extra 10 pounds on my chest, and I really wanted to make this quick. I had previously spoken with my friend about what I was feeling in this house, as we had been friends for years at this point, but never gave her much context. Not even five minutes into the sesh, we heard the footsteps above the garage, i.e. my old bedroom. My entire body went cold. My friend immediately looked at me, and we waited for another second and heard them again. This time, like a stomp type running around the room. We said, screw it packed up and got the hell out of there. I locked up and walked down the driveway completely freaked, trying to push the thousands of thoughts running through my mind out my head. Then, my friend let out a tiny shriek. I turned back to immediately ask her what was wrong. They were doing some work. I thought she could have stepped on a rogue nail or something, but the horror was written on her face and I looked up at the window, but the blinds were closed. I asked her again what was up. She said for whatever reason, she felt like she needed to look up to my old bedroom. She said the blinds were open in the window looking down on us. And I quote her words, this thing with black hair and black eyes and cracked skin and just a hollow black hole for a mouth was staring down. She said it so fast, terror was oozing from every word she said. That's when she burst into tears. And so did I. I was too freaked out to tell her what happened when I was a kid. And I didn't want to scare her more. I suggested we get the hell out of there. Since then, nothing's happened. I recently traveled to Rome, specifically the Vatican, and got a blessed St. Michael pendant for extra measure seeing as whatever it was followed me in silence throughout the years. The thing hasn't bothered me other than showing up in a very specific nightmare I've had every eight to 10 years since my first encounter. If this thing is still on my tail, I'll be due for a nightmare within the next year. I'm a security guard and work graveyard shift for a federal contractor 
in an office building in the Washington DC area and have been at this site for about two months. The building is very secure. You need to get a key card in order to get in, as well as to move around the building. Well, today when I show up to work, the guard I'm relieving tells me that he got a prank call slash death threat over the phone. I told him to shut up and go home, that he was serious and had a report written up and everything. So the other guard tells me that he got a call around 7.20 from someone saying they were in the building in a weird scream voice. He just hung up on them, but they call back a few minutes later and do the same thing saying, come find me, I'm on the seventh floor. And that they would cut him and do all kinds of stuff in that same weird voice. Well, we have to do our hourly patrols between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. But he didn't do any of his because he was too freaked out, and I don't blame him. So I asked him if he didn't mind staying a little longer to do the patrol with me. We do the whole thing pretty thoroughly and don't see anything. So he goes home. It's now 11.15 p.m. I'm sitting at the desk after completing my second patrol, and am a little freaked out myself. That's when I get a phone call. Immediately I start freaking out because it's from a restricted number and the only people that really dial this number are our main office and people from the company we contract for. I pick up the phone and this strange sort of wheezing voice starts saying, what floor are you on? My hands are shaking and I'm basically freezing and don't move or say anything. After asking me the same question several more times they hang up and I call my supervisor, the building security manager and our dispatch. The weirdest part is that the person obviously has knowledge of the building because they called right when I finished my patrol asking what floor I was on and they told the other guard they were on the seventh, i.e. the top floor. Even though I know there's a high chance this is just a prank call from one of our old guards, there's still a slight chance that there's an actual insane person in the building, and I have never been so scared in all my life as to when I heard that voice. That night managed to be one of the longest in my life, but it got weirder. After about six hours had passed, nothing had happened, and I started to feel pretty normal, not 100%, but not cowarding in fear either. I heard a noise at the front door of the lobby. The lobby is shaped like a triangle with the front desk and guard station at the base of the triangle and the whole right side is a big window with the front doors at the far end of that side. I instantly turn off the speakers to the computer and freeze. I don't move for about a minute and roll my chair over to the camera monitors. The display has nine camera feeds and switches to the other nine camera feeds every few seconds so I'm frantically trying to find the ones that correspond to the front door. Now there are some employees that start showing up between five and six, but they all have key cards, so they come up from the garage through the elevator, and no one has ever tried to do this during the graveyard shift. After what I felt like was an eternity, but was probably only 25 seconds, I find the feed and click on it to maximize and standing in front of the door facing towards the camera, not into the building, is the figure. He's in a black suit and has a featureless face. I crap you not. My jaw drops and my heart races to the thoughts of Slenderman. I immediately call my supervisor and tell him there's someone outside the building just standing there. He says he's 10 minutes out and he'll pull up in front of the building. After an agonizing 10 minutes of staring at the feed and this guy not going anywhere, my supervisor finally calls me back and tells me to go to the front doors as he'll walk up in case anything gets crazy. Turns out the guy outside was our new guard that no one told us was coming. I didn't know if I wanted to hug the guy or punch him, but I was glad that one of the weirdest nights of my life was finally over. When I was almost 12, the woman living above me was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she went missing. 
Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This was 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception to the rule, at least in my area. For a little context, I was home alone a lot of the time while my mum was at work about a five minute walk away. My mum had let our neighbour and her boyfriend come in to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and let him in, bringing him into the living room, which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits a few seconds, then hangs up the phone. He does this a few more times before the front door of the building opens. You can easily hear the front door open from where we are, as it's a heavy door and the walls are very thin. It's just the way our apartment is set up. Me and my mum's apartment was the only one on the first floor and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was the only one above us. My neighbor's boyfriend looked at me, put his finger to his lips like he was trying to shush me and told me not to tell anyone he was there before speed walking to my room at the other end of the apartment. I watched my bedroom door close right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock on the door. My jaw dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. He asked if my neighbor's boyfriend was there and being scared, I stammered out. Yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, to which I agreed. And as he was coming in, he asked if I could get his partner in the back door and lead them to my room. We walked together to the back of the apartment and I let in his partner. The back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. There was just barely enough space between the two doors to fit a narrow rectangular table against it without blocking the path to either door. After I let them into my room, I watched as they pulled my neighbor's boyfriend out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, which led to an enclosed fire escape. They told me to go wait in the living room while they brought him out the back door. I walked back to the living room and after they closed the door, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I could hear the distinct sound of metal clinking and quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked and locking the front door on my way out before running to my mum's work crying. I'm pretty sure I cut the five minute trip to about two and I've never been a faster runner. I was fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point. I just wanted my mum. When I told her what happened, my mum was pissed that he had used me the way he had, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet of all the places to try and keep the cops from finding him. She gave me a short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone, telling me that I was not to let people use our phone even if I knew them unless she was home. I didn't know what exactly he wanted from us, nor do I know what would have happened if the cops hadn't have shown up. I don't know if he had known that the cops were on their way and he had come to my apartment specifically to hide from them or if he was up to something else and knew it was the cops when the front door building opened. Our upstairs neighbor's boyfriend, let's never meet again. Let me start off by saying that I'm a single gay guy. So naturally I use apps like Grindr and Growler. Well, one night I got a message on Grindr from a guy called B-Boy, saying how he sees me all the time which was kind of creepy to begin with since the profile picture was just a tongue sticking out and no noticeable features. Two days later, I got another message asking if I smoked the green stuff, to which I replied sometimes, and he invited me over to his apartment in our complex to smoke, to which I accepted. Everything started off innocent enough, conversation, smoking, though he seemed like he was already high before I got there judging by how he was giggling at everything I said. And as the night goes on, he tells me that I need to take the green stuff because it was mine. That I told him to buy it for me, which I didn't, and argued the fact that he offered. 
that no mention of buying ever occurred, so just shut him down and told him that I would give him 40 bucks the next day after work. Later that night after I left, he proceeds to message me that I need to give him the money or he's going to bring it over, or to my job. Again, I told him I'd bring it over the 40 the next day, and this continued several times the next day while I was at work, and by now he's getting on my nerves. Meanwhile, I tell him that I can't have the green, nor do I want it, and to just give it to someone else. So after work, I get the money he's asking for. He tells me that I have to help him pay for his traffic ticket that he got because he went to give me the green and got pulled over for not using a signal. So now he's telling me I have to give him $160 because he can't have a ticket because he's trying to get custody of his kids, which looking on it, I doubt was even a factor. So I get another 140 to give him, but now the traffic ticket has gone up to 200, which sends up red flags and I told him I couldn't or wouldn't pay for it. To be perfectly clear, I'm not giving him money to help him out, but out of self-defense to get him away from me, since I didn't know what to expect just in case he was dangerous. I had to backpedal my steps and tell him I lied about where I lived and worked just so that he wouldn't get them involved but truthfully, I was just glad I never gave him my name or got his. So he didn't have much to go on besides my physical description. I was afraid that he would go looking in our apartment building asking for me, which is exactly what happened. I quickly hid in the bedroom closet while my roommate answered the door and told him they hadn't seen who he was looking for. I quickly called my boss and told him in a very condensed version what had happened and told him if someone comes looking for me who doesn't know my name, just what I look like, that I don't work there and that they don't know me. Then I get a barrage of messages asking if I have his cell phone from at least five different phone numbers, so I know they're all him, which is even more suspicious. I didn't reply to any of these, so eventually they stopped, but now I'm scared to leave the apartment except for work because of that pushy stalker. Let's not meet again. This happened over a year ago now, when I was 17. I quite often get the train into London to visit my boyfriend. I go up on the Friday or Saturday and come back Sunday evening. My parents always told me, and quite rightly, to try and get an early train home on Sunday in order to avoid traveling late by myself. But me being naive and stupid, always accidentally missed the earlier trains in order to spend time with my boyfriend. This particular Sunday, I was getting a train that got into the station where I lived at around 9pm. My station is the last stop on the line and where the train terminates. So by the end of the journey, it is always relatively empty. Sometimes I'm the only one getting off aside from the guard. Usually I would just put in noise cancelling headphones settle down and zone out of whatever was happening around me. I'm quite an anxious traveler, so blocking out the sound helps me relax. I also try and sit at the end of a carriage where there aren't as many people as having lots of people around can make me more susceptible to anxiety attacks. After this evening, I always made sure to sit near people. I'm sitting with my headphones on, tucked away with my suitcase in the footwell of the seat next to me, and a pair of seats next to a window sitting in the window seat. When I notice a man stumble into the seats adjacent to mine across the aisle, he leans across the seats, looks directly at me, and mumbles something to me. He was wearing all black, a massive black coat, and had a big duffel bag. I'm a little anxious because I'm not the biggest fan of talking to strangers. I take off my headphones and politely ask him to repeat himself. His speech is slurred, making what he is saying completely incoherent. But after he's repeating himself several times, I realize he's asking if I know if there are any taxi companies at my station. I say no, sorry, and put my headphones back in. He leans over again and asks me the same question. I take my headphones off and give him the same reply. No, I don't know of any. Sorry, 
he says something else. I ask him to repeat himself because his speech is so slurred I can't understand him. This strange conversation persists for about 20 minutes. I can't understand much of what he is saying. He is sort of half mumbling, half speaking, and he's not really making much sense. He keeps asking me how I'm getting home and where I live. I just say by car and don't say anything about where I live. I'm super nervous now because this guy just gave me the creeps. I had a feeling something bad was gonna happen and he's starting to make me feel uncomfortable. There was just this vibe about him that he was bad news. He then asks me if I'm going to call the police on him and I say no and he starts mumbling and swearing profusely, saying something about beating my brains in. And at this point, I'm really starting to freak out. All of a sudden, he moves across the aisle to sit in the seat next to mine, trapping me in my seat. I can't escape. I'm sitting next to the window and he's completely blocking the aisle. I'd have to awkwardly climb over him in order to leave. I've decided he must be high or drunk because his eyes look absolutely crazed and his speech is so slurred. He tells me that I'm very beautiful and asks if I have a boyfriend, moving closer until I could feel his breath on my face. I look around to see if there's anyone in the carriage with me, but I can't see anyone. He leans in really close and I'm freaking out now. But luckily, the train guard comes through from the next carriage, sees me looking very scared and comes over to ask if everything's okay. Immediately, the guy's demeanor changes. He leans away from me and he waves his hand as if to say nothing is wrong. I say, yes, everything is okay. But by the look on the face of the guard, he can tell I'm super uncomfortable. The guard makes small talk with the guy and then moves to stand by the door behind us. I don't know what to do. Even though the guard is behind me, I still feel really unsafe and now I have to get away from this guy. I asked the guy if he would please move back to his seat and say I don't want to talk to him as he's making me feel uncomfortable. He moves back and starts muttering and swearing again, mumbling half formed threats under his breath. I call my dad, who's picking me up. And when he answers the phone, I immediately say, Hey, dad. The guy looks at me and says, I'm sorry. I didn't know you had a dad. He tries to talk to me while I'm on the phone. He's talking over me the whole time, but I can't actually make out his words. I have no idea how to try and communicate with my dad that I'm not feeling safe. And this weirdo is talking to me without him overhearing. The train is pulling into the final stop. So I pull my suitcase out of the footwell and try to make a quick exit from the train. The guy gets up very fast and goes in front of me, grabs my suitcase and takes it off the train to presumably steal it. I still had my hand on it and managed to pull it back out of his hands. He gets off the train quickly and I stand next to the guard for a few minutes because I didn't want to get off the train at the exact same time as this guy. The guard asks if I'm all right, and I burst into tears. I'm already anxious and tired, and this may seem like something insignificant, but I suffer with really bad anxiety, and it really creeped me out. A lady comes over. I don't know how she knew I was crying about what happened with this guy, but she must have seen him getting off the train. She says he was asking her about taxis and making her feel uncomfortable until she told him to ask someone else. She apologized for sending him my way and they both offered to walk me to my car. Luckily, my dad is sitting in the parking lot and I get in the car safe and sound. There's no sign of where the guy on the train went and I wish the story would stop there. We make it to a small supermarket on the way home. And usually, my dad would send me in to get whatever we needed. But because I'm still upset from the train, I sit in the car in the deserted parking lot. 
As soon as my dad enters the supermarket, a car pulls up on the other side of the lot. I see the same guy from the train in the passenger seat, and my blood runs cold. The car he's in isn't a taxi either, which I found strange as that's what he was originally asking me about. I sink down in the car seat a bit, hoping he doesn't see me. But it's like he already knows I'm in the car. He starts pointing at me and talking to the driver. They get out of the car and start walking through the lot towards my car. I immediately lock the doors. My phone is in my bag, which is in the boot. So all I can do is sit there and pray my dad is gonna come back at any moment. They've nearly made it to the car when my dad gets back. He was only going in for bread and they see him and start walking immediately in the other direction towards the supermarket. I yell at my dad to get in the car. I'm crying so hard, and by the time my dad has got into the driver's seat, the men are nowhere to be seen. I manage to calm down enough to tell my dad between sobs about how the guy from the train was in the parking lot in the car with someone else, and that they were walking towards me. I point at the car they were in, and my dad doesn't say much, and just starts driving home. When we get home, and my mum has managed to calm me down a bit, my dad tells me he noticed the same car driving behind us when we left the station, meaning they must have followed us from the station to the supermarket. I felt really embarrassed, like I was overreacting and making a fuss over nothing, because I'm just oversensitive with bad anxiety. When the guy started talking to me on the train, I felt physically sick and just had this overwhelming feeling that something bad was gonna happen. Even though I have anxiety, I don't usually get these feelings just from speaking to a stranger. But come on, this behavior isn't normal. And I'm pretty sure those guys had far darker intentions for me than we originally thought. This happened when I was around 17 years old, and is still happening now. At 17, I felt lost in the world and stuck in a job I disliked, with work colleagues that didn't like me. This had to do with my accent, as I was quite well spoken, so they thought I was a rich kid. It all started on a Friday after work. The factory I worked in had half day on Fridays, so I would spend the rest of the day wandering around the city I lived in. It had been a tough day of relentless mocking, and I was reaching my breaking point. I went around the city looking for a new job. I visited the police recruitment center, the Army, Navy, and Air Force centers, and even the International Red Cross. I just wanted to get away from it all. After a few hours, I had a bag full of career pamphlets and still no idea what to do with my life. I turned a corner and immediately saw a sign sitting in front of me. I can remember it so vividly. It said, free personality test. Are you curious about yourself? Come in. I then looked up at the building and in a big fancy sign outside it said the Church of Scientology. Now, before I continue, Yes, I already knew about Scientology. However, I had a morbid curiosity about it. I'd heard all the horror stories and goings on inside the church, but Tom Cruise was my favorite actor and he seemed to have his life sorted out pretty good. My famous last words right there. So I went inside. I was immediately greeted by a very nice lady. She asked me how I was doing and what she could do for me today. I asked if I could speak to someone about the church and the personality test. She smiled and said, I would be happy to. Please take a seat and I will get you someone to speak to. After a minute, I was introduced to an older man called Alan. He was the head of my city's Scientology center. Alan took me to a small room to talk privately. When we entered, I immediately noticed the large picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall. We sat down and genially had a nice talk. 
I told him about how I was unhappy about where my life was going, and told him how I wanted to leave plus all the troubles I was having at work. He seemed genuinely concerned for me, and felt like he wanted to help. After a while of talking, I agreed to do the personality test. He gave me the test and left the room, saying to give the test to the receptionist after I had finished. Two hours later, I was done. No joke. That's really how long it took. It was around 500 questions about anything and everything. I handed it to the receptionist, and she told me it would take some time to process. In the meantime, Alan had told her to take me to their private cinema and show me a film. I thought it was just going to be some old room in the back with a TV on the wall, but no. They did indeed have a private cinema that could seat nearly 50 people, and had a very large screen in the front. It did feel a bit weird just being by myself in a cinema owned by Scientology, but I bet that hasn't happened to many people. Or maybe it has. Anyway. I sat down and they played me the film. It was about 30 minutes long and consisted of a narrator explaining those strange feelings you sometimes get with some mediocre acting following along. I remember a section of how much you doubt yourself, knowing you have locked a door, but going back to check multiple times. At one point, the film showed how a past event that happened to your mother while she was pregnant with you could affect your life in a negative way. Example, your mother was sick on a flight, so you're scared of flying. I also vaguely remember something about rotten eggs and how such an event involving them can hurt you. I know it sounds absurd, but in some way the film really made sense to me. When the film was over, I was taken to Alan's office and he told me my results. He told me I was extremely depressed, one of the most unmotivated people he had ever met, lacking cognitive thinking, and I was a waste of talent. Now this made me very upset, but Alan said he could help me. He gave me about four books and a DVD, told me to read the books and watch the film before my course. What course? I asked. And Alan explained he'd sign me up to do a course at the center. He convinced me that if I didn't do the course, my life would soon spiral out of control. He made me hand over quite a lot of money for the course, and said I would receive an email about the course, which was in a month's time. I left the center, ran home, and immediately started reading the books I was given. This happened all over the weekend. I basically locked myself in my room and did nothing but read and reread those books and watch the DVDs over and over again. Over the next week, I began taking notes about myself and my family. I emailed Alan with questions and concerns, and started resenting my mother for my life. I began to think she was the problem, that everything bad that has happened to me was the result of her. I started to treat her badly, swearing at her, and did the best I could to ignore her. When I emailed Alan about my mother, he told me that if she was the catalyst for my problems, then maybe I should consider disconnecting from her. And I took that seriously. I made plans to totally leave her out my life. A week before my course, I developed some kind of God complex towards everyone around me. What I read in those books told me what I could become. I saw everyone in my family as below me. And I really became a truly spiteful person. Just days before my course, I was confronted by my mother and father. They said they were concerned about me and they searched my room. My dad took out all of my Scientology books and the DVDs. I was outraged. I screamed and cursed at my parents. I said horrible, wicked things to them and told them I was going to leave and how I never wanted to see them again. Hours of arguing back and forth, tears and crying. However, in the end, they did convince me that the church was a bad place. They said if I was so miserable at work, I should have told them. And that is true. To this day, I can't believe I didn't say anything to them. Instead, I went to Scientology. That night after the arguing had stopped, they sat me down and comforted me. I really couldn't believe it. After the way I had treated them for the past three weeks, they still cared. 
The next day, I emailed Alan and told him I would not be coming back to the church. He quickly got back to me asking why, asking if it was my family and if I was being forced not to go. However, I ignored him. The emails I received in the next few weeks were mad. He told me stuff like, I should leave my family now and I could stay at the church. He tried to convince me that it was all because of my mother. He even emailed me to say something along the lines of, he won't be surprised if he read in the papers that I was found dead by taking my own life. I'm very sure he crossed a line there, but I kept ignoring him. The strangest email I got was all in binary code. I used a binary code translator, but it came back as mixed up letters and numbers and none of it made sense. I eventually blocked him. However, it still hasn't stopped. About two or three times a year, I will get an email from the church. It's either asking how I am or asking about my family. When I get them, I immediately block their email address because they just keep coming. It's always someone new saying they heard about my case and they were worried about me. The whole reason I'm sharing this is because I just got one of these the other day and thought I would make a good warning. Please, I beg of you, do not go to a Church of Scientology center. If they can make me into a spiteful degenerate in just a few hours, then what can they do with a person in a few months or a year? And if you're lost in life, sad or upset, then please talk to your family, friends or a doctor. When you are down, don't let others make you into a monster. Take it from me. After this event, I got help and I'm a happy, confident person now. Oh, and Alan, if you're hearing this, you made me into a monster. So for your sake, let's not meet again. This is something that happened to me in 2014, about two weeks after my dad passed away. I am a 39 year old female originally from Miami, Florida, and I've been living in the Hudson Valley area of New York for about six years. When in February of 2014, my 59 year old seemingly fit and seemingly healthy father was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer that had spread to his liver. I was devastated. As being a registered nurse, I knew there was no hope. My dad decided to take the chemotherapy treatment against his better judgment because my mum, brother and myself were so distraught that we begged him to try as we prayed for a miracle. After seven months of feeling sick and making little to no progress as had been expected, my dad, mum and the doctor came to the decision my dad would be placed on a hospice and it was time for me to fly back home and spend my dad's last days with him at the house and surrounded by our large and supportive extended family. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to tell my father how much I loved him and what a perfect father he had always been to me. Two days of being on hospice care, all around the clock morphine, my dad fell into an almost coma-like state where he would not open his eyes and barely moved. The next five days were full of anxiety, sadness, and at times desperation. We didn't want to lose him, but we didn't want for him to suffer anymore. Finally, after seven days of being home on hospice, on a beautiful and sunny Miami day, my dad passed away surrounded by family. I was always extremely close to my dad, and at that moment, it was surreal for me. I let out the pain and emotions I had been keeping in for the past week in the form of loud anguished sobs as I hugged his dead body and kissed his face and head. My dad was gone. About a week later after ensuring my mum and younger brother were okay, as could be expected, I flew back to New York as I had work and my children and husband needed me. I was in a fog of sadness and disbelief as I tried to get back to my routine. Two weeks after my dad's passing, I found myself in a dream where my mum and brother and I were walking 
in an indoor place with lots of people from different parts of the world walking around and talking to each other. There was a river that ran through the place, and I and my mum and brother followed it until it reached a bend. And upon trying right to continue following it, my dad appears in front of us. He looked young, healthy, and radiantly glowing. His beautiful green eyes were healthy again, so bright, and I yelled in absolute joy, Dad, I miss you so much. We hugged and then began to speak telepathically, not using words. It's a bit difficult to explain, but basically our communication was entirely through feelings and in our mind, but no words were exchanged. I simply understood what he was conveying to me, and he understood me the same way. This is what he expressed to me. I don't look like this anymore. I came to you in this way so that you'd recognize me. I knew the family was all there, but I missed my brother. Tell Jay that not all of them are good and to not give his light to just anyone. It's important to understand here that my dad's brother was not present during my father's last two days because he was in prison and wasn't due to be released for at least another year. The two had grown up very close because they had been abandoned on the family farm in Cuba to be raised by relatives as my grandmother moved to Havana to start a new life. Regarding Jay, he's my little brother and my dad's youngest son. He had been doing drugs and spending time with bad people and although we didn't know the extent of his involvement in this type of lifestyle, we knew he was potentially in danger. Although smart and spunky, Jay has always been kind hearted and sees the best in others. So he's an easy target for malicious people to take advantage of. After communicating with my dad for a bit, his late mother, my grandmother who passed away a year earlier, came into the dream with desperation and urgency. I didn't want to speak with her, but she insisted I had to listen because she had things to say to the family. I looked at my dad sadly, and he communicated that he could not stay and could not communicate with me anymore because she was there. Apparently she was stronger than him. He was gone. Despite her insistence and desperation, I didn't listen to my grandmother except to learn that she was trapped in a place and needed to move on. I did not try to help or listen further as my dad was gone. I woke up. I had an intense feeling that this was not a dream. And now five years later, I remember the dream vividly and the feeling that this was a real communication with my dad and unfortunately my grandmother. I believe my dad wanted to let me know he was okay. But I also got the feeling that he was very new in the place where he was and not yet strong enough to truly hold his own there. I believe he had an opportunity to speak with me and took it. I've had dreams of him in the last few years, but never one like that. I love and miss my dad every day. Since almost a year now, at the end of August 2019 to be exact, I have moved to an apartment in a different city because my mother, who I lived with in my hometown, passed away from cancer. I have moved here with my long term boyfriend and one other roommate, who has been a very good friend to both of us since before we had even started dating. We all absolutely love it here. The location is great. It's a 15 minute bike ride from my university and is located at a square with a grocery store, drug store, lunch rooms, etc. So we pretty much have everything we could possibly need to survive within walking distance. However, after just a month of living here, someone has started to ring the doorbell at exactly 11.05 PM, semi regularly, sometimes every day, sometimes every other day. Sometimes there's a week in between. And sometimes there's a couple of weeks in between but it's always at around 11.05 PM. And every single time, I get no answer each time I ask through the intercom who it is. Except for once, but I'll get to that soon enough. But first, I thought it were friends from one of the neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell. But after the fourth time I grew suspicious, 
and after more than those four times, I started noticing that it always happened at either exactly or around 11.05 p.m. My boyfriend and roommate both work at bars, and so they work until very late and would usually get in at around 2 a.m. So each time it happened, I was always alone at home, and it started to really freak me out after a while. When I first told them about it, they kind of shrugged it off and said that it was probably a wrong dial, like I thought at first. But when I told them that it had happened so many times, and sometimes even daily, they didn't believe me and thought I was just a little paranoid and spooked. However, one night when the doorbell rang again and I answered the intercom asking who it was, I heard very heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked at that moment. I was again home alone and kept asking who they were and what they wanted. I couldn't make out from the breathing if it was a man or woman, but I heard a strange mumbling and then it was dead silent as they had appeared to have left. I had put my apartment door on a double luck after that. I was so scared and spooked out, and thankfully, my roommate got home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang, and he could tell how upset I was. Now with the coronavirus, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore, and they now also witnessed the frequent door ringing at 11.05. So they now do believe me, and I agree that it's very odd and creepy. We have a balcony that looks down to where our apartment building's main front door is, but because there's also a shop right underneath us that always has those curtains slash roof things out, the view to the door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend and roommate would go to the balcony to see if we could see anyone, but we never could. I have also asked my neighbors from my apartment if their doorbell also gets rang so often, but the ones that I asked said it never happened to them. So two weeks ago, my roommate decides to do some investigating and went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m. He stands across the street and pretended to have a smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said he saw a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building who slowed down his pace significantly as soon as he approached our door. But when he spotted my roommate looking at him, he quickly walked away. We aren't certain if this is the door ringer, but it was certainly was very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't been rung at night since that day, and I'm hoping that maybe it will stop now, but there is a possibility that it will start again in the next few weeks. If this keeps up, I will contact the police about it. I've been planning to ask more neighbors from other apartments next to ours if this is also happening to them. If it doesn't, I will call the cops. I however doubt that they'll do anything right now since the coronavirus and all. The police will only respond to serious crimes or immediate threatening situations. In any case, creepy guy, let's not meet again. I live about a five minute walk away from a train station, and I work one stop away, about a five minute walk from that train station. It makes economic and environmental sense for me to get the train to and from work rather than drive, so that's what I do. One morning at about 8.30 a.m., I was walking to work out of the station I arrive into, and a man walking in line with me about a meter away started waving at me. I had my AirPods in, so I didn't actually notice he was trying to get my attention for a while, but eventually I took them out, expecting him to tell me my lace was undone or that I had something in my hair. Instead, he simply said hello and proceeded to try and initiate a conversation. He asked how my morning was going for my name and told me my name was Beautiful, and then asked if I had a boyfriend. I don't have a boyfriend, but in this instance, I told him I did to try and close the conversation, which didn't work. He proceeded to walk with me all the way to my place of work and carried on walking straight up. 
This is not uncommon, as I work in a popular business district with lots of offices, so I assumed he just worked further up than me. It was the sort of situation where you tell your friends about the creepy guy on the way to work, but I quickly forgot about it and moved on. A week later, I'm walking back from work to the station, ready to get the train home, and annoyingly, all of the trains are cancelled that evening, for some reason. This is an inconvenience, but because I only live a stop away, I can quite easily get a lift home. I call my mum and she agrees to pick me up once she finishes shopping in around an hour. No biggie. Because all the trains have been cancelled, the station is incredibly busy. There are at least a hundred people inside, standing and just sitting around waiting. Luckily, as soon as I walked in, I found a spare seat and sat down, but it was the sort of busy where every seat was taken. I put my AirPods in and just listened to music, wanting to get the ride in an hour. After around five minutes of being sat, the person next to me gets up and another person comes to sit down. I don't even look up from my phone because people are bustling around everywhere. After another two or three minutes, I feel a tap on my shoulder, and lo and behold, it's the guy from last week. He has chosen to sit right next to me. I fake an uneasy smile, and we chat bluntly for about a minute before I put my headphones back in and close him off. The whole time I'm looking down at my phone and he's shamelessly staring right at me, which makes me feel quite uneasy. After around 40 minutes, he taps me again and asks me how I'm getting home. I tell him my lift will be here any minute and stand up to go and wait outside for my mum as she had texted me that she was around the corner. The man stands up and says, oh, okay, good. I guess I'll go get in my taxi then. At this point, I'm like, what? Why is he waiting here all this time for a train then? Oh, you're not waiting around, I say to him. And he straight up turned to me and said, no, I'm getting a cab. I was just waiting to make sure you got home safe with the creepiest smile, as if he expected me to be grateful for it. I note my way out of there ASAP. And luckily my mum had just pulled me up to take me home. I'm telling her the whole story of this absolute weirdo. And as I'm telling her, I get a notification on my phone. I looked down and my blood ran cold. He had just sent me a friend request on Facebook. I had only told him my first name. And even then, my name on Facebook is one letter different to my name I gave him. My place of work isn't listed on my profile, so he couldn't have been able to find me from that. And even so, why would you add my personal Facebook account? I haven't actually seen him since then and I'm so glad that I haven't. I'm hyper aware on my morning commute now and constantly looking out for him. So that's my creepy train stalker story. And I really hope not to meet him again. This happened about a year ago. I was on Grindr looking for either fun dates or new friendships. For those of you unfamiliar, it's a social media app designed primarily for gay men. One day I was scrolling and received a new message from a guy called Brian. I took a look at some of his profile pictures, read his bio and decided that I was interested. We started messaging back and forth and he seemed to be really kind and charismatic, who really knew how to hold the conversation, something that's very hard to come by on the app. A few days went by and we eventually exchanged numbers and he seemed nice enough. I wanted to see if he was a greater person as he was over text message. So I asked him if he wanted to go on a date with me and he very happily agreed. So I scheduled a date with him. The plan was that I was gonna first drive to his place, pick him up and grab some lattes at my favorite local coffee shop. It was around six in the evening and I was sending him a text message to tell him that I was leaving my house, to which he responded with a quaint, I can't wait to meet you. I smiled at his supposed kindness. Then in the middle of driving to his house, I received a phone conversation. 
that goes like this. Hey Brian, what's up? Hey, quick change of plans. I'm feeling tired and would rather not go out. Would you be okay at staying at my place? We can watch some shows and order takeout. I mean, that's not what I really had in mind. I'd like to go out and do things on the first date. Oh, don't be such a buzzkill, just come over. I won't show you a bad time. As he spoke on the phone, I got a really strange feeling in my gut, like something was wrong about how he spoke to me. Before I met him, I had imagined his voice and inflections to sound a lot more lighthearted because of the way we messaged. It was very whimsical and fun, but over the phone, he spoke like he was in a hurry, perhaps slightly frantic. However, despite my feelings, I decided I would accept his offer. Perhaps he was just tired or stressed from the workday. I pulled into his driveway and he greeted me at his door. He looked like his picture and he was very handsome. He was wearing fashionable glasses and his dark straight hair contrasted with his light skin. When we go inside, I was greeted by one of his roommates who was playing Dark Souls in the living room. I wanted to be polite, so I approached the roommate and introduced myself. I didn't want to come off as rude to Brian in case this date ended up going really well. While I'm talking with his roommate, Brian calls my name and beckons me to walk inside his bedroom. I politely excused myself and followed Brian into his room. When I walked inside, I saw something straight out of no sleep. Only this was right in front of me. There were candles lit all around, and when I got a closer look, I noticed there were several altars scattered across the room. Effigies of ancient looking figures, animal bones, and jars with unidentifiable liquids inside them. Some sort of dagger next to a cat's skull. The whole shebang. I don't remember all the altars, but I remember a couple. One of them was on the floor, and there was a glass container that held some kind of yellow liquid around animal skulls surrounding the container. Another altar was on a shelf next to his bed, and this one had a few candles surrounding some kind of doll with its eyes sewn shut and a hand missing. Now that one was super creepy and bizarre. A part of me was telling me to nope the hell out of there immediately, but I thought that maybe I was overreacting to someone's religious choice. I didn't know much about cult religions, so I didn't want to assume that this guy had any kind of malintent. Plus I can be a little overreactive at times, so I decided that I was just gonna go along for the ride. When we walked into his room, I wanted to calm my nerves. And because I have a really curious mind, I decided to ask Brian about what the altars were for. He told me that he would tell me about them later. A weird response, but okay. I brushed it off thinking that it might be just a bit eccentric. I can be a little weird too, so I tried to be empathetic and understanding. Then I point to one of the altars and ask about it. He frowns and scowls. Don't touch that. His voice startled me. His intense inflections paired with his angry expression sent a lump straight to my throat and I felt threatened. I was almost four feet away from the altar, not even close to touching it, and yet, he yelled at me like a father yelling at his kid to stop messing around the church. I was confused, and thinking I had done something wrong, I apologized. In the blink of an eye, his scowl turned to a smile, and he kindly invited me to sit with him to watch a show. What really weirded me out was the fact that his smile kind of felt genuine. He had gotten angry, but all of a sudden he didn't care and served me up a really kind disposition. I was unsure how to process with everything that had just happened. So I decided to sit down with him. He seemed to be acting pretty normal once this ordeal had happened. And we started to talk about ourselves. After some time, he became really sweet and soft spoken, similar to how we were over messages. And we were able to share some stories about our lives. It was starting to feel like it was an actual date, and my nerves subsided a bit, and I was probably just overthinking everything. He then turns on his TV. Now, mind you, I was still a little freaked out by his random outburst, so I was on guard. So I offered to invite his roommate to come and hang out with us. Brian's roommate seemed like an old average Joe when I met him, and I just wanted someone else to be there to act like a buffer. 
I wanted to see how he would act around other people, but when I gave him my idea, he immediately shuts me down, and his personality switched from easygoing to stressed and angry. He started cussing out his roommate to join me, making it clear that he absolutely hated him. The switch was jarring. I also started to panic. Then he changed the subject and began to talk about me. He said that he found me really attractive and in the process his fingers started to graze my thigh. I needed a second to collect myself though, so I excused myself to get some water. When I stood up, he immediately slapped my butt and told me not to take too long. I walked out, closed the door behind me and started to make my way for the kitchen. I was hoping to chat with his roommate to see if I could ask him about Brian, but he was asleep on the living room couch. So I made a beeline to the cabinets and searched for a cup. I thought about walking out and driving home because I didn't appreciate his sudden touchiness, but I started getting paranoid. He had all those altars and he didn't tell me what the altars were for. I've seen some horror films about the occult and I truly had no idea what this guy was capable of. Yes, he was sweet at times, but he was showing me some really aggressive behavior. Who's to say that this guy isn't able to put some kind of voodoo curse on me? Dramatic I know, but you can never really be sure. So I grab my water and cautiously head back to his room. So when I walk back inside, I saw him sitting on the couch with his legs crisscrossed and his eyes closed. When I approached him, I saw his mouth moving but didn't hear anything coming from it. Weirded out, I called his name, but he didn't respond. Strange. I called his name a second time and he opened his eyes, uncrossed his legs and went back to watching TV, without at all addressing what he was doing. What the hell? I was getting really worried, but I did what I could to keep my cool. I didn't want to do anything to upset him or make him lose his cool. I sat next to him on the couch and we started talking. Once again, he was completely normal, unnervingly normal. It's like I was in the same room with a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, except Brian was able to switch between the two seamlessly. I needed to do something, but what the hell was I supposed to do? I couldn't call him out because he might lash out in some way, but I also didn't want to stay because he was freaking me the hell out. I just stay and I try to devise some kind of plan to get out of there without making him angry. At some point he gets up to grab his phone and I thought I would try to dish out the same thing he did to me when I went to get water. Maybe it would release the tension that I was feeling. Maybe he'd like it and I'd make him less aggressive. But regardless, I wanted to try something. I made my move and gave his butt a cheeky grab. Immediately, he turned around, swatted my hand away and lunged at me. He had his hand curled up in a fist and he flung it towards my face. His fist was inches away from making a connection with my right cheek, but he stopped mid punch. In that moment, I saw that his eyes were wide open and his facial expression was cold and emotionless. He was right in my face. My heart was beating so fast that I felt like I was seconds away from an aneurysm. He was looking directly at me and my eyes started back. That moment, I felt like the prey to his predator. Then he uncurled his fist put his icy hand on both sides of my face and started to squeeze. You're so cute. He pulled me in and forced a kiss, and I absolutely did not want to kiss him. But I was paralyzed and couldn't will myself to push him away. His words were patronizing, sort of like he was talking to a dog, and it felt even more like this because he had just scrunched my face against his. I felt disgusted kissing someone who had almost punched me in the face, but there was nothing I could do in that moment. I didn't want to risk annoying him. He slowly pulled away, giving me another sweet smile and sat down, pretending that nothing had happened. Just started staring at the TV. I was over this completely. His behavior was becoming more erratic and more unpredictable. His room was creepy as hell and he clearly had associations with the occult, and frankly, he was scaring me. I eventually decided that I just would rather deal with the voodoo-looking altars later than stay in his house and have to put up with the immediate danger. So I snapped myself out of the anxiety-induced trance, stood up, and told him that I was starting to get sick and that I wanted to go home. 
He got angry and tried to convince me to stay the night, but I gathered my courage and insisted that it was time for me to go. He begrudgingly let me leave, but it was clear that my decision pissed him off. But I didn't care anymore. I said my goodbyes and told him that I'd messaged him later. No way, I thought to myself. I got in my car and drove home, shaking and sweating. I felt relieved to get out of there, but nervous that he might try to do something. The uncertainty of it all is what truly shakes me up, but thankfully no actual harm came to me. Who knows what could have happened if I'd have stayed though. I blocked Brian's number as well as his grinder profile, and even now I keep my own grinder pictures private. I haven't heard from him since, but I still fear that he's going to try and come after me somehow. A year ago, my apartment complex decided they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver, and rent is pretty ridiculous here. So I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I love. I posted on the next door app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in my area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe, who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent soon, and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with them, and I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit, and he asked if he could text me some pictures his neighbor took, because the chat function on the app is really slow. Now I feel stupid for doing this, but I gave him my phone number. I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone, so I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person said, Hey, it's Joe. How's your day going? Huh? It took me by surprise, and I didn't know what to say. He started to talk on and on about the phone, about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day, la 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 la. I finally interrupted and said, so about the condo. He pretty much disregarded that and said, I don't think my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you. I don't have to tell her, right? I said I have to go and immediately hung up. As soon as I did that, he started texting me. It was really bizarre and alarming. I blocked his number and moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. I'm 32 years old, but it was so disturbing to me that I called my parents to tell them about how unnerved it made me. And the worst part was that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible on my profile, but it checked. And sure enough, the unit number was public, along with my address. Unable to contact me any other way, he started messaging me again and again on next door, asking if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't block or report people on the app, so I deleted it. One night a month or so later, I had a knock at my door around 10 on a weeknight. I looked at my peephole, but couldn't get a good look at the person. He had his head slightly down, and either way, I don't answer the door for anyone I'm not expecting especially not a random guy at 10 at night. Feeling panicked, I called my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman, and we look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was a delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to get a look at the guy, and that spooked him because he literally ran away. I have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt like I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know my address was visible on next door. I'll never be casual or lazy about privacy settings like that again. And another story. When I was 18, I was still living at home and started dating a guy who was 20 and lived with roommates. I broke up with him after a few months when I learned he was getting into coke. He didn't take it all too well. One night a few months later, I was up late studying and I had a test the next day. I shut my light off at around 2 a.m., and as I did so, I heard some rustling around outside. Next thing I know, there's a knock on my bedroom window. I was startled, and having no idea who was outside, I yelled for my dad. This story is more funny than scary, but my dad then comes running into my room, 
in his underwear with a baseball bat, his hair all messed up. Who is it? And the person said, It's Josh, sir. My dad said, You aren't dating anymore. Go home, Romeo. Then Josh yells, I just want to talk to you. Please come with me. My dad threatened to kick his ass, so he took off. I looked out the window and saw that he sped off in a car with a couple of his friends. I have no idea what his plan was, but he wanted me to go with him. Could have been entirely innocent, but you know, you get that gut feeling when you get it. I'm a 29 year old female, and my partner is a 23 year old female. We're back in her hometown visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small isolated town in the middle of nowhere, and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with an old high school friend who still lives in the area, Kyle. We met Kyle at the beach, and right away, he's acting super weird, making jokes that are highly inappropriate and unwelcome. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent. But coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was extra annoying. So me and my girlfriend were shooting each other panicked looks the whole time. Once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, and that she's never seen him be like this before, and that we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him we want to get dinner at a local bar, but he just asks to join us. We felt awkward and ended up saying yes. He says he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he followed us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're smoking on the patio and just chilling. The food arrives, we finish it quicker, and here's where it gets really messed up. Halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as I've had a long day. I give my girlfriend that signal that I want to go, and she makes an excuse that we need to leave. He keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got some really good stuff, and you can meet my cats, blah, blah, blah. He's being really pushy. We keep saying no and making excuses, and that we need to check on her grandpa. So finally, we get into the car and say goodnight. We've parked next to each other and walked up to the cars together while saying our goodbyes. When we get in the car, my girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore, understandably. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. He says his GPS is being funny, and can we lead him to the main road? To be fair, we were in the middle of nowhere, so this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously staying behind the bar was out at that point. In the car, we're talking about just how pushy he was being, and how she admits she feels strange driving right back to her grandparents' house. So we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off his exit. We think it's weird, but aren't really sure what to do. Finally, we get onto a two lane road and he pulls up next to us and is waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for a few seconds and then leaves in a hurry. Here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We knew she had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack on the table along with my phone and a few other things a few minutes before we left the bar, as we were preparing to leave. She didn't take it back out. There's literally no way she could have left it at the bar. More importantly, he got into his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning he had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar in the first place and he saw it was left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now the kicker. Apparently, unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend has tasted a very weird bitter taste in her straw at the bar and was already suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. 
This is why she wanted us to stay at the bar to get away from him and stay in public where she felt safer. So when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this. So that's why he had left so quickly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicion sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I'm really shaken up. A few things are clear though. He stole my girlfriend's phone, and it seems like he did that so we would be forced to pull over on a dark road in the middle of nowhere. He also ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed her weapon. And they've been good friends for almost 10 years. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious, I feel he would have acted confused about the weapon or said something like, lol, what are you doing? But instead he booked it, which tells me he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. Finally, he probably spiked our drinks. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I half finished mine and felt very tired. I don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It doesn't really make sense, but he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in the fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless he was working with the bartender, but we were the ones who suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex friend who made creepy comments and probably tried to spike our drinks and stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. Let's not meet again. This happened when I was between the ages of 11 and 12. This was a little over a decade ago. My family and I moved to Philadelphia from New York, and we loved the neighborhood. The owners of the house next door were wonderful. They didn't live there, but rented out their house, and they were also from New York. She told us that she had new tenants moving in. However, the new tenants never showed their faces and never came out during the day, only at night. One time, me and my dad were out late at night, and he parked his car in the back of the house. He left out the car and unlocked the gate when we see a car pull up, not just any car, a luxury car. We both look at each other and pretended nothing was out of the ordinary. There were two people in the car, a guy and a girl. The girl had a hoodie on and the guy had a cap on. It was dark and we couldn't see their faces. They said, hey, how are you? And my dad replied and they quickly chatted. However, the man kept his head down. I introduced myself briefly and the woman swiftly said goodbye and they went into their house. We told our mum what we saw, but then again, he could have been renting out the car, who knows? There was another night where I heard people talking in the back and there were a few cars parked in the back, brand new, shiny, luxury cars. There were multiple different nights where you'd hear voices and people in and out of the house at night. During winter, it snowed a lot. It was around 8 a.m. when me and my siblings would go out and shovel the snow, only to discover our side shoveled, or during the fall wherein our leaves would be swept up. Another day, me and my dad were going out again. And this time, the same guy from last time came out and a different guy came out. The man said that he needed something fixed in his house and then went on to say, Hey, sweetie, how are you? I greeted him back. My dad said sure he could fix it because we weren't going anywhere important. My dad went in there and was in for about an hour. When he returned, the guy paid my dad with a wad of cash and thanked him. And the dude quickly went inside. We got in the car and then my dad told me the dude gave him money for something simple and didn't want him going around the house because the house was a mess. My dad had no intention of walking around the house, but okay. My dad said there was a small door in the wall. I thought it was cool because houses with secret compartments and things of that nature and watching movies are cool. Another few weeks go by. 
My siblings and my dad were in the basement just chilling, and there was this banging and loud scream coming from next door. We thought it was odd, perhaps kids playing or something. My dad left for a brief moment and next thing you know, police cars swarmed our block and there was a helicopter ordering someone to get out. Scared, me and my siblings came outside and you see cops going in and out the house. The cops told us to stay back because all you see were military grade weapons and just bags and more bags in the street. The cops asked me a few questions about them and I just said they didn't bother anyone and that I heard a loud scream before they came in. He was just with us and making sure we weren't scared. Then my dad came and was screaming asking what happened. They told him about what was going on and that we were safe. The news came and started asking my dad questions or whatnot. My mum raced home from work because she saw our house on the news. And after that happened, we learnt they seized over a million dollars of heroin, cocaine, weed, and many others. The weapons were dangerous and usually the military has them, not even cops carry them. The US Marshal came the next day and told us to make sure nobody comes inside the house or knock on the door, and if they do to call them, that was crazy and wild. Back when I was 18, my mum and I had been doing work in the garden, so she was exhausted and went to bed early. It was winter, so it got dark early. I knew I would be the only one awake for the next few hours until her partner got in from working at 4am. I went about my usual nightly routine. I rolled the joint and went out back to smoke it as I did every night, as I was not allowed to smoke in the house. The house had two floors and my bedroom was on the top floor. After I had my smoke, I went back upstairs and continued watching whatever. About an hour later, I decided I would have one more joint before going to bed. I finished rolling and got myself ready to head out into the cold. But just before I went down the stairs, something on my phone distracted me, and I sat back on the bed concentrating on that. When a minute or two passed, I heard a loud bang from downstairs. I thought to myself it was just my mum's partner coming home. Then seconds later, I realised I didn't hear the front gate open, and didn't hear the taxi pull up outside. I didn't hear the front door open, and my cat is on the bed next to me, so it wasn't him and my mum was asleep the next door over. So what could that bang possibly be? I grabbed my taser, which funnily enough looks like a Nokia phone so that my mum also didn't know about it and stuck it in my dressing gown pocket and go into my mum's room. Normally, she's a very light sleeper, but because she was tired from gardening, she slept through the noise. I wake her up and tell her what I've heard she gets herself ready, grabs a metal pole, and we head downstairs. I insisted on going first, because in all fairness, my mum is like 5 foot 6 and 130 pounds, has multiple sclerosis, and is holding a flimsy metal pole. I figured my taser would be a little better should we encounter anyone. Looking around, everything seems fine. However, the last room we check is the bathroom, which is on the lower ground floor to find that the window that sits just above the bath is wide open, with one of our two bottles of Tresemme shampoo and conditioner, which were on the windowsill, have been knocked into the bath, creating the loud bang. Of course, we're like, how could this happen? The wind, perhaps? Obviously not. We were just really scared and trying to make ourselves feel better. It's 2.30 a.m. at this point, and my mum calls her partner to tell him someone has just tried to break in through the window and to please come home. His response, oh, it's probably just a fox or something, close it and go back to bed, you're just being paranoid. So we're like, well, you're no help, and we make sure everything is secure, and call 101, the UK's non-emergency police, to report it. Five minutes later, four police cars and dogs all turn up. They look around and then come to the door and ask the obvious questions. After doing a walk around the house and area, they come back again and ask if we usually keep our plastic garden chairs under the bathroom window. 
No. The police advise us that a dodgy gang have been doing strange things about the area, trying to break in through windows and steal whatever they can. They must have taken the garden chairs to stand on to help them get in. The police also advised that a house a few streets over had just been broken into and everything was taken and the house was destroyed on the inside. I don't think they ever got caught. The thing that freaks me out the most is had I not got distracted with my phone before going out back to smoke, I would have been outside sitting on the same chairs in the pitch darkness where the intruders would have come around and seen me and God knows what would have happened to me as our outdoor light was broke. So to whoever tried to break into my house that night, let's keep it this way and never meet. This was back in 2014. I had moved off campus into a really nice part of town. I was in junior college, and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away, and I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule, and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it, because I walked right through the busy area of town, along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone's throw away from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night, the parking lot would be packed. I'm walking home as usual, get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I've always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden, a huge red truck pulls up behind me. I'm caught off guard because I have my headphones in, and it takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home, so I'm usually just listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop to take my headphones out to look at the truck. This man is dressed like a country singer and sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks me where the mall is and I point him in the direction of it. He says, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer, and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now, and I know where all the bars are located. It makes it easy when they're on the same street. I explain to him there are no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street, and he continued to insist there is a bar behind the mall. All of a sudden, he just changes, he looks at me and asks me to step back, so I did. He looked me over and asked me how tall I was. I told him 5'7". He asked me, I'm doing a photo shoot, would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like getting my photos taken and he insisted, telling me I was beautiful and I would look great. I told him my mum and brother are photographers and have tried to get me to model for them and I don't like having my photo taken. Almost like he's given up on the tacting, he moves to another, then asks me where I live. I told him not far, but he wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity of my apartment, making a point, not to an actual point at all. This dude then asks me if I want a ride. I told him, no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home, and I kept telling him no, stepping further away from the truck. He then out of nowhere asked me, how he would get to the mall, and I told him to take the road down. Go down the road, turn left, the mall will be on your left. He thanked me and began driving off, and I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light, and instead of turning like I told him, he went straight. Going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well enough to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017, and still can't figure my way through there. I made sure the truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he knew was he had to go potty bad. I tried to distract him for 5 or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I finally did take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area, 
and no one had a red truck like that one. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me, and I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone. Never saw the man nor the truck again. So to the guy who wanted to take me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, let's never meet. Back in 2004, I worked for a popular Canadian company that sold cell phones slash cable slash internet and stuff. I worked at a location in the city's local mall for a few years, and over the course of time I got to know and build rapport with the customers that I saw regularly. There was one customer in particular that I served at least once a month. He would buy a prepaid phone with cash every month without fail. As I rang him up the second or third time, I watched him open up his wallet and saw half inch thick watts of $100 bills. Then it clicked. Monthly burner phones, wads of hundos. He was a dealer, for sure. Now the guy was genuinely a nice dude, always polite, knew me by name, asked how my day was, and I enjoyed seeing him come in. I could tell you countless horror stories of the physical and verbal abuse that we endured at the hands of customers at that location. So it was really great to get to deal with a nice person. And the commission and bump in personal sales was always nice as well. One night, I was at home making dinner. I had the TV on in the background. My program had ended and the station switched to the six o'clock news. As I sat down in front of the TV with my food, the news station opened with a story on a murder that had happened in the city. Suddenly, my favorite customer's mugshot popped up, and I sat there mouth agape, listening to the details of the story. It blew my mind knowing that I had interacted with him every month for probably a solid year. He's actually out of jail now, got an early release and everything. And while I'm sure I'm not really at risk, I'd rather not meet him again. This is the most terrifying and vivid dream I've ever experienced, and was a few years ago. I was in my sister's hometown because she was in the hospital. So her room, as well as her roommate's room, was empty. My parents stayed in her room while I stayed in the roommate's. We'd been there for a few days, and I had no previous issues up until then. I was laying on her bed watching TV, on the phone with my boyfriend, and overall drifting off since it was late. I could faintly hear him snoring on the other end of the phone, and I too, myself, felt like I was drifting. I vividly remember what apparently was a dream that felt very real. I was in an unknown house getting out of the bathtub. I walked past the hallway and to the room to sit and watch TV. Everything was normal for a few minutes, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. I turned, seeing the long hallway of this unfamiliar house. The light above it was flickering, like it would in a typical scary movie. I ignored it and looked back to the show I was watching, but again saw something with my peripherals. I turned quicker this time, thinking I'd be able to catch whatever it was before it disappeared again, and I saw a tall, dark figure, but it wasn't a person. I was immediately filled with fear and dread. I was frozen for what seemed like hours. The light began flickering in longer bursts. It would shut off completely, then light back on for a brief second. And every time it did this, the thing would move closer to me. The light would illuminate it closer than the previous time. And I jumped off the couch and tried opening the door to escape, but no matter how hard I tried, the door just wouldn't open. I was scratching and clawing to no avail. I could sense this thing behind me. I knew it was there, but I was too afraid to turn and see it face to face. I was completely filled with fear. I felt something hot on the back of my neck and heard a mumbling, though I couldn't make out what was being said. I collapsed to my knees, still clawing at the door, this thing looming over me even if I didn't see it. I knew it and felt it. 
Suddenly my eyes opened and I was back in my sister's townhouse, but unable to move. I was awake again, but in what I can only describe as sleep paralysis. Movement draw my eyes to the right side of the bed and I could see curtains moving. My mind tried rationalizing it. The fan? No, it was off. Was it the window? No, I never opened it. Again, I sensed movement from the curtains. Something was pushing through it, getting closer to me. I could see the outline of a very tall person like the figure in my dream. My brain was screaming for me to get up and run, but my body wasn't cooperating. The curtain pulled off this thing and I was face to face with it. I wanted to shut my eyes, look away, anything to not see it, but I couldn't even shut my eyes. It was in the shape of a man. As I said previously, it was very tall and skinny, and it was inky black, the blackest black you can imagine. It had no features, no clothes, nothing. It had no eyes, but I felt like it was staring at me. I was in full panic mode at this point. I saw a flicker of color, and suddenly I realized I was staring into a pair of glowing red eyes. We held contact for what seemed like hours, when I felt movement in my body again. I snapped out of it, jumped out of the bed and ran down the hall to my sister's room where my parents were asleep. I knocked frantically on their door, calling for my mum. The knocking turned to pounding, and my call turned to yelling for my parents to let me in. I never turned back towards the room. I was too afraid to see those eyes peering through the doorway, or seeing it stalking me. They opened the door, confused at the sight of their 22-year-old daughter crying and screaming in the middle of the night. They questioned me, but I made up a lie, as I knew they'd think I was having a nightmare or I was just exaggerating. I told them that I thought someone was trying to break in through the window, but that didn't make sense either, since we were on a second story, but I stuck to it. My dad went to check and of course found nothing. Needless to say, I opted to sleep in the floor of their room with my parents for the rest of our stay. I don't know what it was and I can't explain it, but it was definitely a traumatizing experience that I still struggle with. Did I get a visit from a shadow person, ghost, demon? Or was it just all a dream? This encounter happened a year ago at my university. I went to college in Illinois, for clarification. Now I had a class in the late afternoon, and campus was very empty at the time. Most students took classes in the morning. I was the only one walking around campus at the time when two individuals approached me, asking me for some of my time. I'm a polite and well-mannered young woman, and I had some time, so I asked them how I could help. The individuals in question were Asian and dressed a bit controversially for the warmer weather, as this was September in Illinois. They were very friendly and had me sit down at a nearby table so they could explain their beliefs. Inwardly, I groaned and decided to feign interest until I could politely exit. Immediately, they asked me what religion I was. I replied that I was raised Roman Catholic, but no longer identified as such and proceeded to rant on about how all other Christian religions had it wrong. God was their mother, and humans were once angels that sinned against God so were condemned to the earth. The way these individuals spoke set me on edge, and I quickly said I had to go because class was starting soon. Here's where it gets a bit creepy. They got up and started to follow me into the lecture hall, still talking about God the mother, and how they could help me come to the true church. This was a small lecture hall on the edge of campus, and was only used for my class during this time of day. I was half an hour early, so I feared it was just these evangelists and myself in an isolated building. I should also mention this building got very spotty cell reception, so calling the police or campus security would be an issue. I quickly walked to my classroom, determined to lock myself in. Thankfully, my professor was early and saw how disturbed I was and began yelling at my trackers that if they didn't leave, they would call campus security. That frightened them and they took off. 
My professor used the class phone to reach the student center and have campus security take a statement from me and escort me to my car. I've had other more creepy and harrowing encounters in my life, but something about those two people really disturbed me. It was the fanaticism in their eyes when they were speaking to me that was so frightening. After doing some research, I have discovered that these individuals were most likely from the World Mission Society Church of God. The sect was created in South Korea in the 60s and believes that their founder was Christ. I shared my experience with some friends at a party, and another girl spoke to me saying she has been approached by people saying the same thing. Another girl at the party overheard us and said her roommate had spoken about something similar. A week later, my sorority sister and her girlfriend were also targeted by this group. Since then, no one has seen them on campus. Truly, I have no problem with religion. But there have been accusations of this group being a cult and invading college campuses and speaking to young women in order to grow their numbers. Suffice to say, I was extremely frightened by them. I have since graduated and hope they never return. Thank you for taking the time to listening to my story. And if anyone has had similar encounters, I'd love to hear them. Please feel free to share. This is my first time sharing any experience online that happened to myself or anyone else. It was early summer of 2010, which I only remember because my 21st birthday had just passed and I was finally legal to hit the bars. It was a Friday night and I was up having a drink at a bar that my cousin David was the bartender at. It was a small town bar that outside any events like a band or other entertainment being there, it usually just stayed pretty quiet. It was very early in the evening, and I had just gotten out of work for the night, working at a McDonald's in another small town, less than 10 miles from the one in which I lived. I was only on my second drink of the evening when my phone rang. On the other line was a friend of mine from my childhood, James. He was calling asking if I wanted to come over to his brother's house and join them for a night of poker, beer and weed. Sounded like a good time in my book. And since I was literally only on my first sip in my second gin and tonic, I agreed to make the drive into Toledo. Most people know where Toledo is, but for those of you who don't, it's a city in the northwest region of Ohio, about an hour south from Detroit. It was about a 20 minute drive from my small town, and I figured it would be a good time. I stopped at home to grab some cash. I only ever took about 10 to $20 with me, just to make sure I didn't get too caught up having a good time. I left the house at 11.05, and remember this distinctly because I had called James to tell him I was on my way, and they were gonna wait for me to start the poker game at 11.30. We always played a tournament style of poker game, where we put all our money in at once and got equal amount of chips and played until there was only one person left with any chips who then got to keep all of the money. I took my usual route over to his brother Eddie's house as I have done many times before. We had all gotten together, a group anywhere between four to six of us and would play poker in Eddie's basement at least twice a month. I had gotten into the corner of Oakdale Street in East Broadway, and I was sitting at a red light in an area that's nothing but residential housing outside of the elementary school that sat at that exact corner. I'm sitting up looking at the red light, waiting for it to change, which always seemed to take forever coming from this direction. When I noticed something in the sky that from my vantage point was partially hidden directly behind the red light. It was a very bright white light that seemed to be pointing straight down, almost like it was a helicopter using a spotlight to identify something, but much, much brighter at the point of origin. I heard absolutely nothing after rolling my windows down and knew this could not possibly be a helicopter or I'd absolutely be able to hear it. Wanting a better view, I pulled into the parking lot of an ice cream shop that sat directly across the road from the school. I was nearby it 
and got out my car to try and figure out what this thing was. When I got out of the car, I stared up into the sky and immediately found it again. It couldn't have been a plane. It didn't have the right shape. It was more oval than anything, but it was definitely an oval shape. I almost thought perhaps it was a blimp given the shape, but it seemed far too large to be a blimp, even by the measurements of some. Everyone knows, like the Goodyear blimp. Plus it had no decals or identifying marks, either silver or greyish. After what felt like looking at it for 30 seconds or so, my eyes started to burn. Not burn, like in the sense of extreme burning, but it was almost like flies were coming into my eyes and making them water up. I closed my eyes and rubbed them. They were closed and all I see was black. And after getting my eyes to stop bothering me, I tried to look up again to find it, but it's gone. I looked all around, but couldn't see it anymore. This you see is a very densely populated neighborhood with houses, trees, and they're able to obscure things from view if you look up into the sky. And after a little than a minute, I decided that I should probably go and play poker. I get over to Eddie's house, which is about four blocks from where this had taken place and knock on the basement door. A few moments go by and no one answers. I go to the front door and knock. I figured maybe since I'm five to 10 minutes late, maybe they were upstairs playing on the PS3. I knock, but there's no answer. Finally, I start knocking very loudly on the door, almost pounding. And Eddie finally answers the door saying, Man, why the hell are you this late knocking on my door at night? I looked at him, confused. Well, your brother said I could come over and play cards with you guys. He stared at me for what felt like an eternity and responds, Yeah, I know he did. He called you like six hours ago. It's 4.30 in the morning. How late did you think we would be playing to? This scared me quite a bit. As from what I had remembered, at this moment, it could not possibly have been any later than 11.25 to 11.30 at most. I attempted to play it off and say, Damn man, must have lost track of time. Can I use your bathroom before I head back? He agrees and tells me I should splash some water on my face as I look like I'm either drunk or haven't slept in a week. I walk into his bathroom and my eyes are absolutely bloodshot. It almost looks like I have two black eyes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea what happened to me that night. I have no explanation for the lost hours worth of time, how I could not have possibly noticed that much time being passed, or how on earth something that felt like my eyes were being irritated by a mosquito or something similar falling into my eyes. I don't want to pretend to know what it was and explain it, or even assume that whatever it was I saw that evening had anything to do with it. But it has creeped me out ever since. This happened a little before my 20th birthday, about four to five months ago. It was about 5 p.m. and I was waiting for a friend at a bar and he was running a little late. So I went ahead and got my first drink while waiting. As I was sitting at the bar, a guy came up and started talking to me. Definitely nothing to worry about yet. It was a bar and he definitely seemed like he was just trying to pick me up. We had a light conversation and he offered to buy me a drink and I accepted. He called the bartender and I ordered. We spoke for a little, exchanged numbers and I told him I was waiting for a friend and he asked if she was as pretty and unique as me. Being an alternative girl, guys never really know how to compliment. I laughed and said no. He is definitely prettier, and with almost perfect timing, my friend messaged me that he was there but couldn't see me. I told him I was sitting in the end corner of the bar, and he came to find me. I gave my friend a hug and introduced the two. The guy started to act a little strange now, saying that he didn't want to interrupt our night and being kind of standoffish. He said he had to go and just up and left. 
I wondered if maybe he was intimidated by my friend, because he's six foot four but is also lanky. I had his number and thought I'd message him tomorrow. I had a nice night with my friend. We had some drinks and then went to get a few more drinks. About 11ish, it was time to say goodbye and we walked to the train station because we live in different areas and took different trains. His showed up before mine. We said our final goodbyes and I waved him off. I had another 10 or so minutes before grabbing my own train. So I just took out my phone and browsed my socials this is when I got the feeling that I was being watched. I look around and see no one looking at me. And since I was in the city, even though it was kind of late, people were still about. So I went back to my browsing and had someone sit down next to me. Thought it was you, the voice said. I looked up and was surprised to see the guy from the bar. I asked if he was also heading home and he said he was and that he needed to feed his cat. As a cat person, I asked more about that and he showed me pictures. He asked if I wanted to come home and feed and see her too. I told him maybe some other time and he was pretty insistent but I still refused. My train was coming and I stood to go wait for it. As I was about to turn and say goodbye, he was standing as well. He said he was taking the same train and at this point I was a little suspicious, but it was a main train. So we got on and I sat down again and he sat next to me. I had to get off in two stops, then get on another train for another two stops. And he got off also at the same stop and on the same train again. The whole time having normal conversations with me. Obviously I was freaking out a little, so I messaged my housemate and asked him to wait for me at the station. Luckily him and his missus were still up and he asked me why and I told him to just do it. When we got off at the station that was only a short walk from my apartment, I said it was a funny coincidence that he also lived around here. He turned to me and said, no, you're taking me to your place. I apologized if he had misunderstood me, but I never had said anything like that. He said that he was already all this way and that I should just let him come over. Like he was ordering me around. It all felt gross. At this point, I was in full on panic mode. There weren't that many people at this stop and we were in a suburban neighborhood now. This is probably when I looked noticeably panicked and my housemate saw this and came out of the car. He's 29 and quite a big guy. He came over and in his Lebo accent asked if there was a problem. And the guy said that he was my date and that I was taking him home. I said that was a lie and my housemate just walked me to the car and I mean mugged the guy the whole time. Sitting in the car, I got a text. It said, I'll see you again. I had totally forgotten that I gave him my number. I looked up to see him still standing at the station. We locked eyes and he smiled and waved. It wasn't a creepy smile. It looked nice and genuine. Then I think that is what made it creepier. I avoid that bar now and would rather not see him again. I grew up in a small town and could walk and play a couple of blocks from home, but only with the company of one of my older brothers and later our family dog, a super protective Rottweiler mix when I was older. I was never allowed to leave the house by myself because my parents didn't want anything happening to me. There was a well-known neighborhood creep, probably 60 or so in age that lived alone in a house on the street adjacent to ours. In the house next to his lived a couple that were good neighbors and great friends of my parents. Their name were the Smiths. They were about the same age as my parents and loved children, but they couldn't have any of their own. My parents had seven biological kids and four non-biological. I was the youngest. There were a few incidents where I remember running into the neighborhood creep. 
one being when I was at the corner of the gas station with one of my brothers when he came up behind me and smelled my hair and told my brother that I was cute. Another time when I was riding with my dad in his truck and the guy flagged down my dad and asked him if I was my dad's wife and I was 10 at the time. He was a major creep, but there is one incident that will always stick with me. Me and my siblings would occasionally go over to the Smith's house because they were really nice, loved us and would let us swim in their pool as we didn't have one. They would also pay us for doing small odd jobs. They sometimes would watch me for my parents as most of my siblings were teenagers with a lot of extracurricular activities. One day, my brother and I went over to the Smith's house. My brother was in charge of watching me that day and Mr. Smith offered my brother some money to help him move some stuff out of the front of their house for a yard sale and to help them sell things. While the yard sale was going on, I was sitting on their front porch playing with my Barbie doll. A few people had come and gone. My brother and Mr. Smith went inside to go through more things to sell and Mrs. Smith was busy trying to help someone to buy things. Then came along neighborhood creep. He looks around a bit trying to seem interested in buying stuff. Then came up to me, bent down, touched my hair and said, how much for you? I was incredibly shy as a child and occasionally burst into tears, even when someone waved at me that was unfamiliar. The man literally made me pee my pants. I immediately started crying and screaming repeatedly for my brother. Mr. Smith and my brother came running out. And all I remember was my brother picking me up and carrying me home while Mr. Smith tried to figure out what happened. My mother and her cousins often played together as children. Well, there was a rule none of them were supposed to be out after dark. One day when she was around six or seven years old, she and three of her cousins were playing hide and seek. They were enjoying themselves so much, they didn't notice the sun was starting to set while the full moon was rising. Mama was it during this game. And after she finished counting, she went looking for her cousins. She found most of them, except Linda. After some time, Mama found Linda hiding behind a tree near a shaded area in the forest that was a little deeper than she was used to going. Even if it was near her house, it was quite unusual since she and the other children had been told by the adults to never go deep into the woods because they could get lost or taken by the spirits of the forest. Even though Mama was still a child, she could see why the adults had warned her and the other children away from the deeper parts with bamboo, mango and other trees. It would be dark in some places even in broad daylight. But now that it was night, it was beyond pitch black and Mama was starting to get the creeps. Psst! Startled, Mama looked to her left and thanks to a sliver of moonlight that managed to peek through some of the branches overhead, saw Linda partially hidden behind a tree. She had a mischievous grin on her face and was beckoning to Mama to come closer. Linda, my mother was flabbergasted. What are you doing there? We're not supposed to go beyond the tree line and you're not supposed to be giving away your hiding spot. Linda didn't answer, only continued to silently beckon to Mama, but she didn't move. A chill ran down her spine and began to spread through her body as she continued to stare at her cousin. Something wasn't right. She knew it. Her cousin's normally chubby face looked angular, elongated, and her mischievous smile became sinister as she emerged from her place behind the tree, which she soon realized was a ballet tree, notorious for being the residence of evil spirits. She also noticed that Linda seemed to be growing taller with each step. And even though she wanted to run, she couldn't even move and barely scream. The figure that had taken her cousin's face lurched forward bending over so that it almost resembled a hunchbacked witch, its eyes gleaming. 
Suddenly the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs broke the silence. A mama felt someone grab her shoulder before she was yanked backwards away from the evil that intended to steal her away. When she looked up at her saviour, she found herself looking into the eyes of her uncle Simon, who was Linda's father. He had one hand on his shoulder as he moved to stand between her and the sharpshooter that wore his daughter's face with a machete in his other hand. Mama peered around him and found the being backing away slowly until it fully disappeared into the shadows from whence it came. Without a word, her uncle picked her up with one arm and carried her back the way she had come. While she hid her face in his shoulder, not wanting to look at the darkness that could have been her grave. After some time, she found herself being carried into the threshold of her home, her parents looking furious, her various aunts and uncles worried, looking at her. All her cousins from earlier, Linda included, were sitting on the bamboo seats, trembling, with tears running down their faces. After her uncle Simon set her down, he asked her what happened and why she had gone that deep into the forest. She explained what happened, noticing the terrified looks on the cousins' faces as they listened, while the adults became even more tense than they had already been. When she was done recounting her experience, her uncle Simon told her that Linda had encountered someone she thought was Mama while she was hiding, only to realise it wasn't her. She had run screaming from her hiding place, telling him and the others what she'd seen. And when they found Mama's slipper, which she hadn't realised she'd lost while searching, Uncle Simon had told Linda's elder sister to take her and the other children to my grandparents. My mother and her cousins got quite a scolding for playing past sundown, but Mama always felt that it was worth it, since she wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale if Uncle Simon had gotten there a few minutes later. Ever since that night, She's always made sure to keep an eye on the sun when she has her cousins playing, so that they can go in before dark. The next story takes place in my father's ancestral home in his hometown, which is a place where no one wants to try and make a life beyond its boundaries. The house is now abandoned and lies in ruins. These events took place three to four years before he passed away. I was already an adult in my late twenties. I was temporarily staying there with my father while waiting for news on the various job applications I had sent out online since my last job in the city had stressed me out so much my health had gone downhill so I had to leave to recuperate. The house was already old and in the state of disrepair and I have to tell you I was praying for the day that I could leave because not only were we living a hand to mouth existence but my father is domineering and has a controlling attitude. It was really grating on my nerves. He kept rubbing it in my face that we were surviving on his retirement pension, since I was too weak to hold the job for a year. And he even had the audacity to tell me that I should let him manage the inheritance from my late mother's estate once it was released. He wanted to use it to set up a business, mainly because he wanted me to live out my days in that dead end town that he called home when nothing happened and no one wanted to leave their comfort zone. What he didn't know was that I would never let him touch what was mine. I was basically the maid at home doing all the cooking, cleaning, laundry, the works. I was also constantly being humiliated by our father to the relatives that we have and acquaintances since I am and still mostly a loner. The only people I could really talk to being a few cousins who were also outcasts like me. He may have been my father, but he should never have been allowed to raise kids since loving and nurturing has never been something he understood. It was always about control. You are his puppet doing his bidding. As I mentioned, the house was old and falling into disrepair. At the time of this story that I'm about to tell you, it was no secret that the house was haunted, even when my grandparents and other cousins resided there during my high school days. But they aren't the ones I'm going to share with you. On many occasions, I would see people walking through the house, 
but when I would turn to look at them, there was no one there. The passing visitors weren't just limited to human beings. Many times I even saw the animals. I had one come close to me, visit after their precious lives had been cruelly cut short, all in the name of finger foods that should have been eaten to go with the booze. It was almost as if my four-legged friends were coming to see me one last time before going to their eternal reward. And when I told my cousins, whom I was close to about them, they said it was because those creatures remembered the kindness I had showed to them and knew that I loved them. There was one apparition in particular that seemed to follow me around all the time, that of a little boy, about three years old. When I would be cleaning the yard, I'd see him from the corner of my eye sitting on a bench or standing a few feet away watching me. However, he would be gone once I turned my head to look at him. Whenever I was in the kitchen preparing a meal, he would be peering at me from around the kitchen door. He was mostly a blurry figure, like what you see on the old TV screens when the signal's bad, and I could never see his face, but knew he was there. Once around dusk, my father was out talking to his friends and I was upstairs folding the clothes that I had gotten off the clothesline since they were dry. When from the corner of my eye, I saw that child and he began to inch closer to me as if curious as to what I was doing. I didn't feel threatened by him and spoke to him gently hoping that I could give him comfort in some way. The next day, I went to my cousin Leela's house. She and her siblings, along with their mother, Susan, are fellow outcasts like me, but for different reasons. Technically, they're paying for a sin that was committed by their matriarch. Susan is my eldest cousin on my father's side, so Leela and her siblings are my nieces. Leela, though, is my age, and Anna is five years my junior but I look at them all as cousins, no big deal. I told Leela, her younger sister Anna, and their mother Susan about the little boy I kept on seeing, and they all became very quiet before exchanging a long look. Leela told me that it's known behind closed doors that Susan's half-sister Victoria had several extramarital affairs and many abortions afterwards. The latter were all performed at the ancestral house they said that the little boy might be one of the children who paid for their mother's sins with their lives, and he clearly took a liking to me. Because even though I'm not a mother, I'd never hurt a child. That little boy was my constant companion when I wasn't visiting Leela up until June 2014, when I started a new job in a city almost 12 hours away from where my father lived. Leela and Anna were also able to start a new chapter of their lives in a city 13 hours away from that pit we were stuck to. Two months after I left. We still keep in touch and remain close as ever, because in my eyes, they, along with the maternal uncle, I have a soft spot. And my sister and her three children are the only family I have left now. My father passed February 2016, and when I went to attend the funeral service, and tie up the loose ends he had left. I saw the house had continued to deteriorate after I was gone, and I was glad. I had always felt like the life and whatever courage I had to try to hold on to after my mother died when I was 12 was being drained from me the entire time I'd stayed there. The house is now in ruins, completely abandoned, and the trees and plants that thrived when I was there have since withered. This happened to my childhood friend, Jean. He was the only son of an immigrant couple. They had him in later years, so he lived a completely sheltered life and had a complete lack of social skills and social development. They had no other family around, only friends, mostly other immigrants from the same country. Jean's father was very well off, but he lived like a miser. So Jean grew up thinking they were middle class bordering on poor. When Jean was in his thirties, his father passed away from an illness. Shortly after that, his mother was tragically struck by a vehicle and killed as she crossed a busy street. Jean was left all alone and in charge of a fortune and assets he was ill prepared to handle. 
Out of nowhere, a relative from the old country appears. She was young, attractive, and a lady, supposedly a distant cousin. Soon she was seen with Jean here and there, not too often, but often enough that people began to notice. Three months later, Jean simply vanished. No one knew where he went, why he wasn't around, and now the cousin had control of the fortune. Another friend of the family got concerned and called the local police to report him as a missing person. The guy in charge told the friend to never inquire again about Jean, to better leave this matter alone. No one knows what happened to Jean, but several of us have several guesses. I live in New Orleans, and years ago, my brother wanted to adopt a dog from a small rural town about two hours away. It was an easy enough drive, but we got close to the town of Clinton, and I started noticing a ton of police driving around. No sirens, nobody speeding by, but I think I probably saw 15 to 20 patrol cars in the span of about 10 minutes. We get to the house, meet the foster mum and the dog, who is the sweetest thing in the world, and decide to adopt her and head home about two hours later. Everything seems fine. Tally, the dog, climbs up in the front seat while I'm driving and falls asleep, leaving my brother to sit in the back by himself, which was hilarious. We keep driving and notice that there are even more cops driving around, but still no sirens. They're just everywhere though. As we're leaving Clinton, maybe about three miles or so to the exit, I notice this old white sedan coming flying up on our rear, flashing their lights and honking. I didn't really think about it, but I figured maybe these people were hurt or needed something. It definitely wasn't a cop car, but it was unusual for sure. I started to pull over to the shoulder and they pulled over as well about 10 to 15 yards behind us when they stopped. I stopped the car and when I turned around, I looked at my brother. For some reason, as soon as our eyes met, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end and I realized there was something very wrong about this. I hesitated, wanting to see if someone needed help. But as soon as the door of the car behind us opened, a voice in my head said to get the hell out of there. I peeled out, sped for the exit, making sure nobody had followed us, and we got back to New Orleans safe and sound. But the entire time I was watching for that car to ensure they didn't follow. I never learned what happened with all the police cars or the white sedan, but something was really wrong. I should have listened to my gut way sooner. Stopping even temporarily was really stupid of me. I hypothesize that there was some kind of raid or something, and the cops were looking for someone as we were driving through. The white sedan was trying to get us to pull over so they could carjack us and dodge the cops further. I don't know though, and I hope that it was someone innocent that needed help and I just bailed, but I don't know. I have a pretty strong feeling, as does my brother, that there was something funky going on. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at mine. One day she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all night study session which she had known about and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going back to her place and I never heard anything from her again. After three days of texting her, trying to make sure she was okay, her messages starting coming back as number not found. I sent her the stuff she'd left at my apartment in the mail, and it returned as no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I had never messaged but knew the name of, disconnected, and it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline, and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates, and didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings, just to make sure she was alive. 
The school she was at didn't have any record of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone. None of our mutual friends ever saw her again. And I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in this stretch of road between our two schools that night, or in the two weeks that followed. I didn't ask for a longer time frame because at that point, she was already missing. Cops wouldn't file a missing person report because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive, or in witness protection, or was erased from all time by an evil wizard. She literally vanished without a trace. I would like to share with you a story that happened to my mother at the end of last year. We're from Catalonia in Spain. My mum is a doctor who works on a public hospital as a radiologist. She has no mental illness and is overall healthy, and the building is in good condition with no gas leaks or the like. She had a friend who went to her workplace to have some mammographs done. Everything goes as usual, and when they're done, my mum goes to an adjacent computer room where the images have been sent. She closes the door after her and no more than 30 seconds later, she hears the door knob turn violently as if someone was trying to enter the room. At first, she thought it was her friend. So she called, come in. Note that the doors have lead protection to avoid ionizing radiation piercing through, but the knob kept turning. They were shaking it as well. So she yelled, come on in and thought how rude it was for them to act like this. It was then she realized her friend could not be there as she was putting her clothes back on and there was no way she'd be ready. She explicitly told me she had the feeling there would be no one behind that door once she opened it. So that was it. She quickly opened it to see no one there. There have been a few other incidences around that room too. For example, one night there were two doctors with my mum when suddenly one of her co-workers witnessed a bottle of gel flying at extreme speed against a wall. There was nobody there beside the three. They were all astonished. I know this sounds a bit cliche. Maybe I'm not too experienced, but I can assure you she didn't make it up. One of her co-workers says there really is something wrong with that floor. No one really knows what. There is one strange thing that happened during my childhood that I know was not a dream, nightmare, or a sleep paralysis episode. We lived in a tiny row home and I shared the attic with my brother Dave, who was a year younger than me. The room was split with an open staircase and Dave slept on one side of the room and I on the other. There was a wall light at the top of the stairs that we usually kept on at night. And it happened to be turned on the night when something unearthly dropped in for a visit. I was about eight at the time when I woke up in the middle of the night to a loud and almost deafening electronic humming. Not unusual was that my thin blanket was covering my head, which is something I did regularly when I went to sleep. Highly unusual, in addition to the humming sound, was that I could clearly see the shadow of a three-fingered claw-like hand moving up and down above my head. I was terrified. To my young mind, it was the devil. I could conjure up no other explanation. Who's there? I managed a few times, but the non-human hand just continued to get closer to my head and then further away. It was like it was performing some odd religious rite. I could not gather up the courage to remove the blanket that was over my head to face whatever was attached to the claw. But I did peek out of it slightly in my brother's direction. Dave appeared sound asleep and I started to yell his name. Dave didn't budge, but that could have been due to the electronic humming sound which I immediately realized was muffling my voice. My terror grew greater as I started to scream for my parents. Nobody came. I turned my focus back 
to the claw-like hand and tried to communicate with it again, but it just continued to move up and down, with thick, outstretched fingers that came to points at the tips above my head. I closed my eyes and started to pray. Every now and then I would open my eyes to see whether the hand was still there. It was still there, and I should have known it was still there because the humming sound was constant. I prayed and prayed and prayed. The next thing I knew, it was bright outside and morning. But it wasn't like I had a nightmare and woke up. It was like time had passed between the moment I was praying and the time I woke up. It wasn't like waking from a nightmare at the breaking of day. Something had happened late the night before. I passed out somehow. Hours went by and then I awoke. The entire event lasted about 20 minutes and I was wide awake the whole time. There was no doubt, it was not a dream. Of course, when I told my mother about it in the morning, she did not believe it was real. I argued with her for about 30 minutes, but she insisted that I only had a dream. It crossed my mind at the time that I am only a kid and no one is going to believe me. As the years went by, I sometimes told the story to friends and family members, and many times the response was the same as my mother's. It must have been a dream. Well, for over 10 years after the event, the only explanation I could muster was that the thing in my room was something satanic. I've always known that something was in my room that night and that it could not have been a dream. It was not until the late 1980s or early 1990s that my opinion about the event started to change. The first time I had any knowledge that some people believed in extraterrestrial beings were coming to Earth was in the late 70s or early 80s. I'd watched science fiction films growing up as such, like Earth vs. Flying Saucers and War of the Worlds. I even went to see Close Encounters of a Third Kind in a movie theatre sometime in 78, but I never seriously entertained the possibility the beings from other worlds were actually coming here during the first 10 or 11 years of my life, in either 1979 or 1980. My father was watching an episode of the TV series In Search Of, a documentary that was hosted by Leonard Nimoy. The episode speculated on the possibility that beings from other worlds were coming to Earth in flying saucers. It was the first time I had ever been presented with information that extraterrestrials could actually be real. I was fascinated, but I didn't really know what I thought about it until years later. After watching shows on television in the late 80s and early 90s about people who claimed to have been abducted by aliens, a bell started sounding off in my head. The Night of the Claw finally started to make sense, right down to the electronic humming sound. It wasn't Lucifer who appeared in my bedroom that night. It was an alien. Even though I embraced this new concept, I still had some doubts about an extraterrestrial reality. It was simply too fantastic. Besides, I would never be able to prove conclusively to anyone that an alien had indeed infiltrated my childhood sleeping quarters back in the 1970s to lull me into some weird shock because I was the only one awake to experience the event. I knew something very odd had happened. I knew for a fact there was something in my room that night, no matter what anyone else said. And I knew there was no way, no how, that the event was a dream. I still know it, and I'll always know it. I also believe there's a strong possibility that something more happened that night, but I have no conscious memory of it. I know for sure that when I was praying to God to save me that night, I was far from sleepy. I was frightened beyond belief and not at all feeling like a little shut eye. I woke up at night for a glass of water. I walked into the kitchen and ran into my dad. He walked right past me to the front door, didn't even acknowledge me being there. Where are you going? I asked him. He didn't say anything and just had a blank stare and walked out the door. I walked over and looked out the window, looked through the peephole 
and we had a small walkway that connects to our driveway. He was sitting on the hallway, hunched over, elbows on his knees under a big tree. That was in front of my bedroom, just staring into nothing. I walked into my mum's bedroom and asked her why Dad was outside. She turned over and said, "What do you mean? He's right here." There was my dad, laying by my mum's side, in a deep sleep. My whole life, my mother has told me snippets from her childhood, from what I've learned from her, my father, and eavesdropping on family conversations. My mother had a terrible childhood. My grandfather was an abusive junkie, who left her home alone for days at a time. It wasn't until she was seventeen she was able to escape. In her mid twenties, she met my father, and they got married. They tried for years to have children, but had been told they would never be able to. Then, on March twenty sixth, two thousand and one, my grandmother had an overdose in what is now my parents' bedroom. We don't know if it was accidental or purposeful, but they believe it was an accident. The next day, the twenty seventh, was the date put on her death certificate. Exactly one year later, my parents had their first child, me. Growing up, I didn't know anything about my grandmother besides her name. That is until one day I was in the fourth grade, going through our home library. I come across a book and am instantly drawn to it. The book is a law book. I liked books so much that I took it to school the next day to read. That is when I decided I wanted to become a lawyer, and I plan on starting college next year to pursue that dream. The reason I'm telling you this is because I would find out later that the book had belonged to my grandmother, and at one point in time she herself had been in law school but never graduated. There's always been small coincidences such as these that have made me feel connected to her, as if she was still here now. This is where things begin to get weird. For as long as I can remember, I hear things at night in the attic and walls. The obvious answer would be animals, but I've heard animal sounds in the attic before: scratching, scampering, squeaking. But that's not what I hear. It's thuds. Heavy things being moved about, high heels was very common when I was younger. My sister and I have bedrooms on one side of the house, and my parents on the other. For years, my sister and I have been complaining about these noises, but my parents have never been able to find anything or hear anything themselves. Everything I've told you so far is interesting, but I didn't consider it enough to share. But things have been getting weirder lately. And I've become genuinely concerned. Personally, I've always believed in spirits, and that there may be one in this house, but I never had anything besides noises and feelings to back it up. That is until a few weeks ago. I was having a bad day, so bad in fact I was sitting on my bed sobbing. This may seem dramatic, but I felt the need to open my arms wide and release my emotions, and that was the first time it happened. I heard something. And I looked up. The cords on my fan were swinging back and forth rapidly. My fan wasn't on, and my arms weren't long enough to reach the cords. I even tried to stretch and touch them from where I was sitting, but I was at least two to three feet away from even being close. Now to the reason I'm sharing this. About half hour ago, I'm sitting on my bed watching a show, when I heard a noise. I look up. And only one of the cords was moving, and fast. My fan wasn't on. I put my hands around the cords to feel if maybe air had done that, although it doesn't explain how only one would be moving without the others being affected. I'm honestly very freaked out, and would appreciate any thoughts and suggestions.